Hello everybody and welcome to my first ever Stitch Wraith audiobook. Um, I'm going to be going through all of the Stitch Wraith audiobooks and so make sure you subscribe for that. Um, but yeah, this is the first one. I have read this one, but I haven't read the others. Um, as you can see, this one is highlighted. Um, that I, I used to do that. For all of the for all of the stories, and I just kind of gave up with the other ones. Anyway, this is the audiobook for the first ever Stitch Wraith story. Um, hopefully, you enjoy it. It's gonna be very short, um, but hopefully, very law significant. <laughs> so let's begin. Propping his foot on an open drawer, Detective Larson leaned back in his wooden desk chair. Its typical creak sounded unusually loud in the absence of the daytime chaos of the divisional office. The bullpen was crammed with 12 desks, double that number of chairs, triple that number of computers and monitors and printers, a smattering of bulletin boards and storage cabinets and work tables, and the lone malfunctioning coffee maker stuck in the corner. The coffee maker spewed out abysmal coffee, but it made a musical hissing sound that a couple of the detectives thought sounded like Ride of the Valkyries. It was on one of it's more screeching crescendos right now. Larson shook his head. He only noticed how depressing the place was when all the people were gone, as they were on this late Monday evening. He should have gone too, but he wasn't in a hurry to get back to his empty apartment. Ever since his wife, Angela, left him, filed for divorce and embarked on a mission to be sure he saw their seven-year-old son, Ryan, as little as possible, Larson didn't see the point of going home. Home wasn't home. It was a two-bedroom walk-up that, according to Ryan, smelled like pickles and had the ugliest carpet ever. He'd told himself he'd stay up late and catch up on reports, but he was really just sitting there feeling sorry for himself. Was he really the horrible dad Angela accused him of being? Sure, the job forced him to miss a lot of Ryan's games and school events. Yes, he'd broken a lot of promises to his son. I'll be home in time to throw the ball, Ryan. Turned into, sorry, I got a new case. I'll take you camping this weekend. Turned into, I'm sorry, the chief called me in. He's your son, Everett. And Angela kept saying to him before she left. He's not an afterthought. He should be your reason for being, not something you'll get around to someday. Angela just didn't understand. He loved his son, of course but this job wasn't just a job. Yeah, he was definitely feeling sorry for himself, not the best use of his time. Larson shifted, trying to find the ever-elusive, comfortable position in his desk chair. He looked around at the place where he'd spent two-thirds of his life over the past five years. It really was a bleak room. Dingy, beige walls, flickering fluorescent lights, scuffed grey linoleum floor, all that furniture in perpetual disarray. Were detectives so lowly that they deserved such a rat surroundings, or were they just too darn busy to do anything about it? Larson shifted his gaze to the line of narrow windows that marched along the outside wall of the room. At the end of the row, he noticed a skinny ivory, a skinny ivy vine growing to, through a gap between the window frame and a dirty window that let in the sickly yellow glow of a street lamp. There's my favourite sucker. Larson suppressed a groan. That's what he got for not going home. Chief, he said. Chief Monaghan wended his way through the empty desks, wrinkling his nose when he passed Detective Powell's monument to slobbery. What is that stench? The chief looked down at the piles of paperwork and empty food containers. Don't know. Don't want to know. From where Larson sat, the office smelled like disinfectant. His partner, Detective Roberts, whose desk faced uh, Larson's tidy domain sprayed the stuff incessantly, <laughs> incessantly to mask whatever it was that seemed to have died in Powell's desk. The chief propped a foot on the extra chair next to Larson's desk. He held out an envelope. Larson eyed it. He had a strong sus suspicion he wasn't going to like what was in it, so he made no move to take it. The chief tossed the envelope in onto Larson's smudged green desk blotter. Sorry, It landed next to the row of freshly sharpened pencils Larson had lined up for his evening's drudgery. The stitch wraith, the chief said. No one else wants it. I don't want it. Tough. 
The word sounded exactly that when the chief said it. A compact, prematurely grey-haired man. The chief made it clear early in his career that his size and hair colour had nothing to do with his ability to kick ass. He wasn't big, but he could do what any big man could do. And he sounded like a big man with a loud, rough voice that you couldn't argue with unless you actually ha absolutely had to. Larson had to. He did not want to see what was in the envelope. The Stitch Wraith is an urban legend, Larson protested, still not touching the envelope, which lay like a big slug next to his foot. Not anymore. You had the latest. Chief Monaghan clearly wasn't going to listen to dissent. <laughs> Larson sighed. How can he not have? It was all over the news, and the public was demanding answers. A local teen, Sarah or something, disappeared a week before, and the detectives assigned to the case, not Larson, who gave thanks for small favours, had several dozen eyewitnesses who claimed the girl turned into garbage right before their eyes. Now, admittedly, the eyewitnesses were public school kids, not always the most stellar purveyors of truth, but in this case, their stories had a ring of authenticity, in spite of the outlandish con content. Uh, yeah, just just a little warning. Obviously, that was from To Be Beautiful. Um, if you haven't read the other stories in all of the books, I highly suggest doing that before you read the um, the like the respective uh, epilogue. Uh, because all of the stories tie together and it will be easier to understand and better in general if you read all of the stories and then the epilogues. Uh, so that that's just something I want to say. I know I'm probably late to, to saying that, but anyway, that was from To Be Beautiful. I, I, love, I love the stories. It's great. I heard, Larson admitted. Can't make heads or tails of it. I know. But this morning, we had most of the witnesses back in to see the psychologi uh, psychologists. <laughs> the strengths confirm that witnesses believe what they're saying. Same goes for the people who've seen the stitch wraith. Larson rolled his eyes, then said in a deep voice, a strange cloaked figure roaming the streets. He returned to his normal, unremarkable voice. Did I go to sleep and wake up in a horror flick? The chief snorted, then indicated the envelope with a shift of his square jaw. You haven't heard the best part. Open it. Larson took a deep breath and put his foot on the floor. He tipped his chair forward. It creaked again, this time louder, as if it, too, had no interest in the stitch wraith and needed to voice its own objection. Larson picked up the envelope. Pulling an inch-thick stack of papers from it, he flipped through a few witness reports. Like the school kids' reports, these witnesses' testimonies all sounded sim similar though they still had enough detail to diminish the possibility of a hoax. The Stitch Wraith, witnesses said, was a shrouded figure in some sort of cloak, cape, or hooded coat. It had a lurching walk, a complete disinterest in others unless bothered, and an obsession with dumpsters and trash bins. It was usually seen dragging garbage bags full of no one knew what. He'd heard all this before, he and most of his fellow detectives had d dismissed it as bunk. Setting aside the witness reports, Larson flipped through the next sheets uh, in the envelope. They were all suspicious death reports. Larson kept his face blank as he read, and he was glad the chief couldn't see the frisson of dread that skittered along his nerve endings. He felt like the reports dropped a stone into the pond of his life, and now, their impact was rippling inexorably uh, outward toward some future he wasn't going to like. Larson flipped through the stack. Five? Five withered bodies with... He looked down and read from the top report stack. Eyes that bled black down the sides of the face. More of that? The manner of death wasn't new to Larson, unfortunately, but he'd known of one victim and he didn't know it had anything to do with the stitch wraith. Chief Monaghan shrugged. Larson read more carefully. Two of the dead men, found, had impressive criminal histories. Larson recognised one of the guys. He'd collared him for assault a few years back. 
He separated out the two reports and tapped them. I bet these two tried to mug the guy. The chief, who had, read, who had finally sat down in Larson's visitor chair, nodded. I agree. He leaned forward and pointed to a stack of photographs uh, Larson hadn't looked at yet. Look at these. Larson flipped through the photos taken from security cameras near the stitch raid sightings. He squinted at one that showed the figure pulling what seemed to be a mannequin's torso from a dumpster. What the heck is he doing? The chief didn't answer. Larson kept going through the photos. He stopped again. From under the hood of what looked like maybe a long trench coat, a bulky white face peered out at night. Larson stiffened so he wouldn't recoil. He wanted to drop the photo and get as far from his desk as he could, but he didn't do that. He just stared at the strange visage uh, and concentrated on breathing normally. He wasn't going to let this craziness rattle him, especially not in front of the chief. The face wasn't a face, not a human face anyway, unless it was damaged, it, unless it was a damaged human face covered in bandages maybe. It looked more like a mask. The face was round and its features were drawn onto the curved white surface. Done in thick black marker, the black features looked like a child had made them. Larson deliberately relaxed his shoulders, which he realised had been creeping towards his ears. It's just a stupid mask, he told himself. Larson looked up at Chief Monaghan. A mask? Your guess is as good as mine. Larson looked back at the face. It had dark eyes, one of which looked blackened, and it had a terrifying mouth with a missing tooth and something stuck between the remaining front teeth. Weren't, were those blood stains around the mouth? We got a match on it. The chief pressed his thin lips together in what could have been a smile. He liked dropping bombshells. A match on what? This? Larson pointed at the blurred and bizarre face. The chief nodded. And you're not going to believe where we got it from. Grim wasn't always lucid. Well, now, it wasn't good to fib. The truth was that Grim was rarely lucid. Being lucid made his teeth hurt. His teeth hurt when his eyes and his ears hurt. When he was lucid, the world had this way of assaulting his eyes and his ears. Everything was too intense, too much. Grim preferred to hang out in his own crazy world where the voices in his head ruled, even when he knew they were crazy. Grim's teeth hurt tonight. In the shadows, pressed against the corrugated metal sides of a storage shed near the train tracks, Grim pulled his dirty pink acrylic blanket tighter around his body. Though the blanket was damp and provided no warmth, it comforted him. Also, because it wasn't just dirty, it was so filthy, you had to pry at the blanket fibres with a fingernail to find a hint of pink. It gave him camouflage. Camouflage was good. Ever since he'd walked away from his life, he'd done everything he could to be invisible. He hunched his five feet eight inches into several inches less than that. He ate just enough to keep skin hanging on his bones. He covered his long, stringy brown hair with a floppy grey hat. Uh, he hid his long face under a matted beard, and he gave up his name for the nickname he'd been given. He made it his goal to be unseen. He especially did not want to be seen right now. No way. No how. He, want, he didn't want to be seen because he didn't like the pounding and clanking. And he didn't like what he was seeing. He was seeing ominous things. Things that hurt his teeth. For the last five minutes, Grimm's gaze had been riveted on the railroad tracks. Or again, tr truth was important. Not on the tracks themselves, but rather what was on the tracks. What was on the tracks was disturbing him greatly. On the tracks, illuminated by the peripheral glow of a security light, a cloaked figure was prying bizarre items from the rails. The figure was slightly hunched and moving in on an in an awkward pitch and roll gait that reminded Grimm of the way people walked at after coming off a boat. Grimm was only 20 feet or so from the hooded person, but he could clearly see both the figure and what it was collecting. The person appeared to be unaware of Grimm, and Grimm intended to keep it that way. Grimm's teeth wanted to chatter, and his body wanted to shake, but he willed himself still as he watched the mysterious figure pound at the end of what looked like a foot-long pry bar with a bright yellow end. 
The yellow end kept wriggling free pieces of something Grimm couldn't identify. So far, he'd seen it collect a hinged jaw, a jagged row of what looked like bloody human teeth, mutilated, uh, I'm sorry, mutilated human eyes, uh, several bolts, a computer port, and chunks of metal with tufts of dark green fur. Obviously, this is the plush trap chaser. <laughs> um, now he continued to watch while the figure pried up one and then two green oblong objects. What were those? As if answering Grimm's inner question, the figure held up the pieces. Even in the muted light, Grimm could immediately discern what they were. In his previous life, he'd been a professor, and even at the rate he'd been prick, uh, pickling his brain cells, he still had many at his disposal. Green rabbit ears. Oh, his teeth. The figure went back to prying, and it worked free of the tracks. A large metal rabbit foot. Grim had to admit to himself a modicum of curiosity about what the figure was doing. But his sense of self-preservation was stronger, so he sat with aching teeth, as still the bits of de 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 what is that word? As the bits the figure was collecting. Uh, until the figure put all the pried up parts in a bag and disappeared into darkness. Detective Larson knocked on the door of a one and a half story brown craftsman house squatting next to a two story craftsman for its four times its size. He looked down at the well maintained porch he stood on. It looked like it had fresh paint. He noticed the entire house was in similar condition, but the paint and tidiness wasn't weren't having what was possibly their intended effect. The house he stood in front of looked diminished, not just in relation to its bigger, stiff, spiffier neighbour, but in general. If houses had faces, this house would look hand-dog. A mission-style door opened in front of Larson, a pretty young woman with almost cartoon large eye eyes and shoulder-length brown hair looked at the detective with absolutely no interest. Yes? Ma'am. My name is Detective Larson. He showed the woman his shield. He g she gave it the same non-attention she was giving him. As part of an ongoing routine investigation, I need to look at the premises. Do you have any objections? The woman squinted at him. He thought he saw the glint of something lying dormant in her gaze, like she had some spark that, that had been nearly but not fully extinguished. He wondered if that spark was about to light an objection to his entry. He didn't know what he'd do if it did because he didn't have a warrant. The woman shrugged. Come on in. Crossing the threshold into a meticulously clean and neat living room, he looked around and saw that a small kitchen and dining room were in similar condition. This in spite of the fact that the house contained at least four cats, which lounged in various displays of regal ownership on the backs of the furniture or in puddles of sunlight on braided throw rugs. I'm Margie. Ooh, I'm Margie, the woman said. She offered her hand. Larson took it. It was cool and limp. She looked up at him, one eyebrow raised, as if she was waiting for him to answer some unasked question. He smiled at her, but said nothing. He wondered what she saw when she looked at him. Did she see the 30-something decent-looking guy he used to see in himself, or did she see the deep lines forming around his mouth and eyes, which was all he could see now, when he caught a glimpse of his face in the mirror. She looked away, her gaze landing on two of the cats. She frowned and shook her head. Sorry about all the cats, I'm not sure how this happened. I was given one to keep me company after... Um, well, just to keep me company. Ooh. Um, I know, so I know some of you might be reading this just after reading Fazbear Frights 2 and you haven't read the other ones. But that makes a lot of sense, knowing who Margie is in a later story and what happened to her. Um, I won't spoil that for you. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about if you know what I'm talking about. Turned out it was a she and she was pregnant. I couldn't bear to give the four kittens away. I felt like their mum and it seemed like abandonment. So here I am, a cat lady. She gave a dry laugh and then coughed. Larson had a feeling she used to laugh a lot and had gotten out of practice lately. He wondered what had happened to her. He was tempted to ask, but that wasn't why he was here. Larson started wandering through the house. Margie followed him. How long have you lived here? He asked. 
He'd found that chatting with homeowners tended to distract them when he was checking out their place. It gave him more time to poke around before they started getting uncomfortable or even defensive. Just over three years, her voice hitched between three and years. He glanced at her. She sounded like she was going to cry, but her eyes were dry and her face was placid. I was hired to take care of a sick boy while his dad served overseas. Here we go. He passed away and left me the house. The dad or the boy? Larson wondered. He didn't ask. Larson had stepped into a short hallway with three doors. A filth, a fifth cat appeared from inside the last door, not filth. It was a small grey tabby. It sat down in the middle of the hall and started cleaning itself. Larson looked into a small, shiny bathroom and then into a decent-sized bedroom, the one the woman was obviously using. A fuzzy yellow robe was folded neatly at the foot of a queen bed and cosmetics were lined up just as neatly on a cherry dresser. Other than those touches, he thought the room had a distinctly masculine feel. Larson decided not to comment on the woman's relationship with her dead employer, whatever that relationship might have been. He didn't need to risk sitting her on edge. He continued on down the hall. The old house creaked and shifted, emitting something that sounded like a groan. He was pretty sure Margie flinched at the noise. A dark grey cat meandered down the hall, sniffed the grey tabby, and then rushed against Larson's black slacks. He bent over and scratched it behind the ears. He knew he'd be sorry later. He was allergic to cats, but he still liked them. Stepping into what was obviously the second bedroom, Larson stared at the single bed in the middle of the room. Other than the bed, the room held only a small cabinet. He wasn't sure what to make of this room, but he was compelled to stay in it. Specifically, the cabinet grabbed his attention. Next to him, Margie was quiet. She was close enough for him to smell um, what he assumed was her soap or shampoo. It had a fresh but clean scent, nothing heavy or alluring like perfume or cologne. In spite of the makeup she wore, he got the impression Margie didn't care much about doing things to impress others. He wondered if that was why he found her attractive. He liked her simple transparency. No, she wasn't spilling her guts to him in the annoying nervous in the annoying way nervous witnesses often did, but she wasn't trying to be something she wasn't either. He could tell. He cleared his throat as he meandered around the bed toward the cabinet that had captured his interest. We've been pursuing a person of interest in the ongoing case I mentioned. The case has been at a near standstill. It's gone without any leads until recently. Now we have this. He reached into the inner pocket of his grey sports jacket and pulled out a photo, which he held up for Margie to see. Margie said nothing, but her face had a lot to say. First, she flushed. Then, as quickly as her cheeks went pink, they lost all colour, and she blanched. Her eyes widened. Her mouth opened slightly. He heard her breathing quicken. About to call her out on her reaction, Detective Larson did a stutter step of surprise when the grey tabby suddenly jumped onto the single bed. Sorry, Margie said again. She picked up the cat. It immediately started purring. Larson couldn't help himself. He reached out and rubbed the side of its face. Suddenly aware he was very close to Margie, he stepped back. The cabinet was right in front of him. He hadn't realised he'd reached it. Now he had to see what was inside of it. At the same time he was drawn to it, he felt an inexplicable reluctance to open the cabinet door. He sneezed. Excuse me, he said. It's the cat, Margie said. It's okay, he was lying. He'd be miserable the rest of the day. He realised he was putting off opening the cabinet, which is absurd. So he grabbed the cabinet knob and pulled on it. The cabinet was empty, but the walls inside of the cabinet weren't. They were covered in harsh black scribblings jammed close together. What looked like nonsensical letters made by a thick marker covered nearly every inch of the cabinet's interior. Larson could see no meaning in the scrolls, but nonetheless, they gave him the same th feeling he'd had when he'd looked at the recent grotesque death reports. Larson turned and looked at Margie. What happened in this house? <laughs> of course, I know what happened in the house because I've, I've read The Real Jake in Fazbear Frights. Uh, six, but if you haven't read that, then you, then just wait, <laughs> just wait. 
Larson sat at the elegant oak roll-top desk that dominated one end of his otherwise ending but elegant living room. If he sat at the desk, the top of which held an antique green banker's lamp and above which hung a print of an eagle flying over a meadow, his back was to the rest of the room. From here, he could pretend the other part of his living room didn't exist. Everything else in the room, the stained card table, two folding chairs, a ratty easy chair and a blue vinyl beanbag chair only made the place seem more empty and sad. Taking a sip from the glass he held balanced against his chest, he looked at the framed picture of Ryan that the banker's lamp illuminated. Ryan had been six when the picture was taken. He'd just lost his front two baby teeth. The resulting gap gave his freckled, blue-eyed face an impish look Larson loved. People said Ryan was the spitting image of his dad. Larson guessed he saw it. For sure, he and his son shared dirty blonde hair, freckles, blue eyes and a wide mouth. Ryan had gotten his mum's nose, which was good for Ryan, but sometimes all Larson saw when he looked at his son were the differences between them. To Larson, his own face looked hard and closed, while Ryan's was still eager and open. How long would it stay that way? A few days before, Larson had gotten a glimpse of what Ryan would look like when the possibilities of childhood collapsed into the obligations of adulthood. Larson had promised, swearing on a stack of comic books or no less, that he'd take Ryan to see a movie premiere. Work had gotten in the way, and Larson had cancelled. Ryan didn't. Ryan hadn't taken that well. You don't do anything when you say you'll do, Ryan had screamed. His face was red and contorted with crushing disappointment. I'm sorry, Ryan. Ryan had sniffled. Teacher says dads are like superheroes, but you're not. Superheroes don't break promises. Larson's phone rang, and he snatched it up. Anything that could save him from the memory of his many regrets would be welcome. The stitch wraith was spotted again. Chief Monaghan rasped. I want you to get over there. Where? The old fire site. You remember that bizarre fire? Sure. Larson set down his drink, glad he'd only had a couple of sips. I'll be there in ten, he stood. Wait, isn't that the second time it's been spotted there? Don pulled open the heavy metal door of the old X factory and he and Frank headed to the food truck parked in the middle of what used to be one of the defunct factory's assembly rooms. The truck, no longer mobile, was permanently placed in the room, and it was surrounded by wood picnic tables. It was a weird setup, but then Dr. Phineas Taggart, the man who owned it all, was weird too. I believe uh, Dr. Phineas, by the way, was in Fetch, I think. I read it so long ago, I, I don't remember... Um, but I think Phineas is, f is, from, uh, is from Fetch. Don spotted Phineas sitting on one of the picnic table benches and he nudged Frank. They watched Phineas carefully pull the tail of his pristine white lab coat from underneath him and smooth it, then just as carefully spread a white linen um, napkin on the rough table in front of him. He flicked a speck of dirt from the napkin's corner, then opened his sandwich wrapper in the precise centre of the napkin. Thank you, Phineas said to the sandwich. Cells, please process this food with love. Still talking to your food, Phineas? Don called. He rolled his eyes and winked at Frank. Frank just shook his head. They watched Phineas close his eyes. It, well, it looked like he was praying, but they once told him he was creating a mental shield out of light when he did that, whatever it meant. Hello, Don, Phineas said. As I have previously explained, I am not talking to my food per se, I am talking to cells, both the cells in the food and those of my body. Right, right. Don nudged Frank again. Can you say one sandwich short of a picnic? He muttered to Frank. Frank, who had the same darkly tanned face and forearms and broad thick shoulders that Don had, set his hard hat on the picnic table next to the one Phineas sat at, and he stepped over to the food truck to order his food. How's that shield coming? Don asked, dumping his hard hat next to Frank's. Phineas watched Reuben, scribbled down Frank's order. Then he looked at Don. I am developing a modicum of expertise with shield creation, Phineas said. Frank returned from ordering and plopped on the picnic table's bench. Dust billowed up from his thighs when he sat. Don noticed Phineas's nose twitch. He probably wasn't thrilled with how, with how sweaty he and Frank smelled. Phineas was a little prissy. You gotta hear this, Frank, Don said. He looked at Phineas. Tell him. Phineas looked at his sandwich. 
but then he straightened his narrow red tie and adjusted the stiff collar of his grey dress shirt. He cleared his throat. The creation of a personal field has its origin in the work of a psychologist who did a series of experiments on the effect of being stared at. Why would anyone study that? Frank asked. Don, who stood at Ruben's uh, counter ordering his food, said, I hate being stared at. Makes my skin cool. He loved winding Phineas up and listening to him sprout off about all the weird stuff he was into. Precisely, Phineas said. That's why this psychologist was studying the phenomenon. Why does it bother us when people stare at us? To measure the test results, the psychologist used EDA, electrodermal activity readings. The readings show responses of the sympathetic nervous system. That makes perfect sense, Don lied. He winked at Frank, who grinned. Phineas was oblivious to their amusement. He continued his inf informational download. The results of his experiments were that close. The, were that... Oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> the results of his experiments were that those being stared at showed significantly higher electrodermal activity when they were being when they were being stared at than would have been expected by chance. Frank shrugged. So what? He rolled his eyes at Don, who chuckled. So, Phineas went on. This man did other experiments as well. He wanted to know if it was possible for people to influence others with negative intentions. If it was, could one protect oneself from these negative intentions? He conducted more experiments, in which one group of subjects was given no instructions, and another group was instructed to visualise a protective shield or barrier that would protect against inference or another person's, of another person's mind. The experimenters then attempted to raise all of the subjects' EDA levels by staring at them and willing the levels to rise. The result was that the group that had shielded themselves showed far fewer physical effects than the other unshielded subjects. So will your shield stop speeding bullets? Don laughed when, as he took his grinned ham and cheese from Reuben. Phineas smiled. Speeding bullets aren't nearly as dangerous as human emotion. He picked up his sandwich and took a bite. Frank snorted. With his mouth full, he said, That's just stupid. My neighbour's anger can't leave me gunshot, but the old lady's gun sh uh, shotgun can. You're looking only at the short-term timeline, Phineas said. You see the result of the shotgun's energy, so it seems greater to you. Human emotion is slower to impact, more insidious. It emanates us fr from us or is excreted from us, if you will, like sweat or tears, and it wafts outward like a noxious cloud soaking into the surroundings. For some time, I have been studying the effect of these emotions. I'm getting close to a breakthrough. I'm assuming this is talking about agony. Phineas left his ersatz, I don't know what that means, sorry. Phineas left his friends by the food truck and returned to the main part of the X factory, his private area. He wished the food truck was his private area too, but alas, Reuben wouldn't agree to that. When Phineas used to work at Evergreen Laboratories, Reuben's food truck used to be parked outside the ugly concrete building that housed the labs. When Phineas retired, he asked Reuben to set up shop in Phineas's factory con converted to laboratory because he loved Reuben's food. Reuben agreed, only if he could remain open to the public in general. Hence the presence of men like Don and Frank. Phineas knew that they and others thought he was nutty, but he occasionally enjoyed their company. Phineas brushed his teeth after lunch and made sure he still looked spiffy. Being ret retired was no excuse to get sloppy, so Phineas still dressed as he had for work, and he still kept his greying hair trimmed short and his round homely face clean-shaven. When he was growing up, his mother told him, being ugly is no excuse to be a slob. She also frequently asked him, what do you need looks for when you have such a brain? Phineas agreed with his mum which was why his life's work, not the pointless farm... Oh my gosh, what is that? Pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical, I don't know, pharmaceutical work he did at his job. But his true calling was the study of the paranormal, the study of energy and its effects on all matter, animate and supposedly inanimate. Satisfied that he was presentable, Phineas left the bathroom and walked down the narrow hall to his protected room. Punching in his security code and deactivating the pneumatic seal that guarded his treasures from errant energy such as all of those of mold spores and the like. 
Phineas entered all the all-white room of shelving and glass cabinets. There's so many long words. <laughs> Indulging himself, as he did daily, he strolled up and down the roads looking at his accumulated bounty. Phineas knew that to the untrained eye, the items in this room would look like either rubbish or the collection of a horror movie aff Oh my gosh, what is that? <laughs> Uh, you can read that for yourself. Uh, it all depended on perspective. Only Phineas knew that every item in this room was said to be haunted. Haunted was not a term he himself used. Usually used as a word to refer to something embodied by a ghost. The word could also mean part of what Phineas knew to be true of all things. Haunted could mean showing signs of torment or some kind of mental anguish. And this was the more important definition of the word. These items on Phineas's shelves weren't possessed by ghosts. The ones that were truly haunted were energised by agony. Okay, here we go. <laughs> the rack, the head crusher, the wheel, the Judas cradle, these torture devices were some of the purest examples Phineas had collected. But he also had everything from the Madonna's image on toast to non-mechanical dolls that opened their eyes by themselves to a rocking chair that rocked on its own. He'd acquired all of these special objects from online auctions. He loved each and every one of them, but he couldn't linger here all day. He had work to do. Exiting the protected room, Phineas returned to his small office, where a laptop computer sat in the middle of an, a simple oak desk. There, he began to type up his latest findings. As I expected, he typed. Extreme human emotion appears to impact its surroundings far more powerfully than well, the more negative it is. Agony, I'm convinced, radiates further from people than any other emotion. Love has its influence, but the experiments being done with water crystals have been misinterpreted. Uh, sorry, misinterpreted. Just because love forms beautiful ice crystals doesn't mean it's the most powerful emotion. Yesterday I mimicked the ice crystal methodology. Me oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Yesterday I mimicked the ice crystal metho metho methodology. There we go methodology, <laughs> and by allowing all the hurt and anger I usually keep well in check to burst forth, I watched water manifest a hideous crystal in the matter of seconds. Phineas stood and crossed the grow light over his collection of exotic flowers. He ran his fingertips over the lobster claw shaped yellow and orange heliconia, the satisfyingly symmetrical lavender lo lotus flower, the red clusters of flowering ginger, and the bright and red perfumed passion flowers that reminded him of blood-soaked blood starfish. Other researchers had their water. Phineas had his flowers. He believed flowers, not water, were nature's purest vessels for emotion. He was drawn particularly to the passion flower because the passion flower was known to hold a vibration so pure and innocent that its energy could repattern consciousness. Phineas leaned over and inhaled the flower's pungently sweet scent. This flower, he'd learned from an expert in flower energy essences, was known to repair the ego. It could literally mend the super-ego e and facilitate enlightenment. He believed that he was approaching the day when he was so attuned to the flow of his own energy that he could get in resonance with his extra or extraordinary blossom. But not now. Phineas checked his watch. It was time. Every week, Phineas received a new shipment of emotionally charged items. This week, he had some very special objects coming. Hurrying down the hall to the loading dock at the back of his old brick factory, Phineas practically skipped over the stone floor. He couldn't wait to see his new purchases. Yo, Finn, a burly bald man, called when Phineas stepped onto the concrete platform. Hello, Flynn. Phineas bounced on the walls of his feet and rubbed his hands together. He leaned forward to peer into Flynn's truck. What have you? Flynn leaned over and picked up a box. He grinned. You're putting me on. You know what you've ordered. Today's a special day, right? Phineas laughed. Flynn leaned back and widened his warm brown eyes. Well, Doc, that's some mad scientist evil laugh you got there. Do you like it? I've been practicing. Nailed it. Flynn, his pink head glistening in the sun and his back muscles rippling under his black t-shirt, began unloading boxes in onto the dock. Phineas didn't bother anything. Uh, sorry, Phineas didn't bother explaining to Flynn that Phineas didn't even have a natural laugh. 
One of the reasons he was so fascinated by the bandwidth of human emotion was because he could never seem to access the whole range of emotions himself. He didn't have a natural laugh because he'd never felt real joy. What he felt now, though, had to be close. Flynn unloaded the fourth box from Phineas's shipment, checked his manifest and said, That's it, Doc. Let me just get the handcart and I'll take this stuff back to your lab. Thank you, Flynn. Phineas was careful not to add a hurry up, even though he wanted to. Flynn wasn't dawdling. Phineas was just impatient. Flynn tossed the handcart onto the dock, then jumped up and stacked the boxes. The tower was over his head, but he said, got it, and went off down the hall, holding the top two boxes on the cart with his left hand as he pushed the cart with his right. Phineas scurried after him. It only took a few seconds to reach the main lab, which was the vaulted core of the factory, which had once been the factory floor. Previously full of automate, automated uh, assembly equipment, the space was home, was uh, home. Sorry, was now home to Phineas's various methods of measuring energy. Like Broad, he had his EDA, he also had his EEG, his REG, his MRI, and his X-ray machines. He'd used all of them at one time or another in experiments designed to measure the brain, no, emotional energy left behind in objects that had been near the site of a tragedy. Right here, Flynn. Phineas pointed at two large bare tables and Flynn shifted his stack of boxes to the floor between them. He gave Phineas a salute. Have a good one. I will. Before Flynn had taken a step, Phineas was tearing into the first box. Peering into it, he saw a stack of party plates. Wonderful, he said. <laughs> he opened the second box which was flat and oblong. When the, when the box was open, Phineas found himself staring at his own reflection. This was the decorative wall mirror that had watched, uh, um, whoa. This was the decorative wall mirror that had watched a man murder his entire family. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, what agony might this contain? Oh, interesting, okay. Phineas ran his hands over the shiny surface. Then he took a deep breath and opened the large square box. As he suspected, this box contained yet another box, an empty jack-in-the-box box. Wonderful. This is going to have a lot of juicy agony in it. And last but not least, yes, there it was, lying in a puffery of styrofoam peanuts. A man-sized endoskeleton lay, just waiting to be activated and given a purpose. Phineas lifted the endoskeleton from the box and he frowned when it hung limply in his arms. He hadn't expected it to be this broken. Well, no matter. At the moment, it looked like nothing, just a ruptured metal network made to stand in for human bones. But it wouldn't be nothing for much longer. Don't worry, Phineas said, I'll provide. Phineas got right to work, hooking together the lines and electrodes of his various energy measuring devices. He set up what he thought of an energy cascade. The machine, would pour energy already captured from previous items into the first new item, in this case the plates, and then usher that energy through all the additional new items until they culminated in the endoskeleton. Phineas stepped back to watch the process. Not that there was anything to see. Unfortunately, the transfer of emotional energy occurred at a frequency the human eye couldn't discern. If Phineas turned out all the lights and used a blue light, he could detect just a bit of the energy flow. He discovered, however, that blue light tended to distort the field. He couldn't risk turning it on now. Instead, heeding his growling stomach, Phineas decided to return to the food truck for an early dinner. How's your daughter doing? Phineas asked Reuben when Reuben fried the portobello mushroom for Phineas's veggie burger. Reuben shrugged, his black ponytail swaying. Still painfully shy. I can give you a remedy for that, a flower essence called Mimulus. Reuben leaned on the counter and cocked his head with a smirk. What's a flower essence? He made it clear he was poking fun at the idea. Phineas disregarded Reuben's tone. In the early part of the last century, a homeopath discovered that diluted energies of various plants and flowers had an impact on emotion in the physical body. A flower essence called Mimulus transforms fear into strength, so a flower would make her less shy. Reuben shook his head and looked up at the ceiling in what even Phineas could tell was a now I've heard everything expression. Phineas ignored the dismissal. Not exactly. The energy of a flower would make her more confident. Only a molecule or two of the given flower is suspended in a solution of water and alcohol for each flower remedy. Oh crap. 
Reuben realised he'd burnt the mushroom. Sorry, he started over. So, is that what you're working on? Flower energies? Not quite. Phineas straightened and clasped, clasped his hands. You see, I'm convinced that agony has greater energetic radius and power than any other emotion. I have done numerous experiments to measure, capture, contain and study the leftover emotion embedded into objects that were near a tragedy. My work is focused on my hypothesis that you can take a saturation of agony, add any kind of intelligence, even an artificial one, and they will combine together to transmute the energy of emotion into the energy of physical action. This, I believe, is what explains what people call haunted objects. Reuben laughed, shook his head, and managed to properly cook Phineas's portobello. No disrespect, Doc, but I'm glad I don't believe in magic. Your flower essences sound like hocus pocus. But the rest of that stuff you just said, that's even worse. It's bad mojo. Maybe, Phineas admitted. But maybe it's the key to understanding the energy of all things. By the time Phineas returned to his lab, the endoskeleton lit up like a Christmas tree when Phineas t tested its energy levels. It was ready. Now he just needed to give it a little more presence so it could properly express the agony it had soaked in from the other items. Phineas hurried to his protected room. He knew exactly what he needed, so it would only take a few minutes to place the items in separate boxes and return to the lab. There, he put the boxes on the table next to the bare endoskeleton. Running his hands over the metal skeleton, he revealed in the electric energy dancing at his fingertips. First, a head, he whispered. Reaching into... Into the first box he'd set on the table, Phineas pulled out a three-foot-tall white doll covered in drawings done in coloured markers. The doll was truly an, abom uh, an abomination of decorative overkill. It had rainbow fingertips, green knees, brown smudges on its body and face, uh, uh, sorry, body and legs, and various bibs and blobs glued to it, one of which appeared to be a smiley face eraser. Uninterested in the doll's body, Phineas grabbed the doll's flat, black marker-drawn face and pulled it from the doll's neck. He then affixed the head to the top of the endoskeleton. That's better, he said. Gives you some personality. He reached into the second box. And now for some heart. The item in the second box was an animatronic dog that clearly no longer functioned. Fetch? <laughs> Phineas sat, set his shoulders and prepared himself to touch it. The dog was an ugly dog, as ugly as Phineas himself. <laughs> what with its matted a greyish brown fur, triangle shaped head, and wide mouth full of sharp teeth. Yeah, it's definitely fetch. But it wasn't just ugly, it was wrong somehow. Of all the items in Phineas's collection, he found this dog to be the most menacing. He sensed the dog had been responsible for some powerful agony. He'd never seen, he'd never been entirely comfortable having it around. But now he was going to take it apart, so it wouldn't be a threat. Using sharp shears, Phineas tore into the dog's fur. Then he used pliers to pull out wires and circuitry. In minutes, he'd revealed the dog's battery pack, located in the dog's chest, where its heart would have been, uh, had it been a, a living dog. Lifting the large plastic encased unit, trailing a tangle of entwined wires, uh, Phineas studied the endoskeleton. Where to install it? Phineas dismissed plugins in the endoskeleton's head and neck, and instead found a suitable port in the endoskeleton's chest. He grinned when he looked at it. <laughs> There, now my tin man has a heart, he chuckled. The moment the endoskeleton got its heart, it became more than an endoskeleton. It became an animatronic being of great energy, and it moved. Phineas laughed, genuinely laughed, in pure, in pure glee. The being of great energy reacted to Phineas's laugh by turning to look at Phineas with its black marker eyes. Phineas kept laughing, and the being reached out to touch its creator. Phineas held its breath as the metal fingers met his skin. Then, in one crowded instant, three things happened. Phineas saw the being's battery pack pulse bright red. He suddenly sensed danger and attempted to throw up a mental shield. He began to convulse, grabbing his head to attempt to contain the excruciating pain that annihilated his consciousness. Oh! Oh! Although Phineas owned the building where Reuben ran his business, Reuben thought of the ca cavernous room that held uh, his truck and the picnic tables that surrounded it as his own space. The rest of the building was Phineas's space, and Reuben had never gone into Phineas's space. It wasn't that it was off limits, it simply seemed impolite to wander into Phineas's domain. This afternoon, though, 
Reuben thought he had to venture into the heart of the old brick building. He was worried about Phineas. In the two years since he and Phineas had reached their agreement, Phineas had never missed a, me a meal um, at Reuben's truck. Today, he'd been absent for both breakfast and lunch. Something was wrong. So Reuben went where he'd never gone before, and in minutes he discovered why Phineas had missed his meals. Phineas was dead. He was not only dead, he was withered into near mummification, his mouth gaping open, his eyes gone. When Reuben found Phineas, he immediately staggered back to his truck. He called the police, who came, investigated, and announced that they suspected some kind of electrical discharge killed Phineas. Reuben wasn't so sure. He spent the rest of his day trying not to see Phineas's body in his mind's eye. He didn't want to see that or the weird lab with its wilting exotic flowers. He especially didn't want to see the black tear streaks that had stained the dead scientist's face. Ooh, black tear streaks, huh? Interesting. In the middle of the stack of Phineas's belongings on Flynn's truck, the energetic being lay under a large heavy tarp that smelled like turpentine. Its metal extremities extremities or whatever, uh, vibrating with the rumble of the truck engine. The being sat up. Turning, it surveyed its surroundings until its gaze landed on a pile of clothing. The being grabbed a cloak from the pile and slipped it on. Ah, okay. So Phineas was responsible for, I, I guess, gathering lo lots of objects with, with high agony and he put them together with an endoskeleton and it created the stitch wraith that killed him. I see. So that was that was essentially the origin story of the stitch wraith. And we know who Phineas is because of, of Fetch. Um, and we know that he took the battery pack from Fetch. Um, and I think, I think possibly the face I, that he was talking about, the doll, was probably from the real Jake. Jake looked down at himself and tried to get used to the fact that himself wasn't anything like the himself he'd been used to being before. Last he could remember, he'd been a little boy. He hadn't been a boy in a while. He didn't know how long. So it wasn't totally weird that he wasn't in a little boy's body anymore. But it was still pretty weird that he was in a thing that wasn't alive. It was also weird that he couldn't remember exactly who he'd been when he was a little boy. He had vague bits of memories, but they didn't make sense. Like, he could remember thinking it would be fun to come back to life as a puppy or a kitten, but why would he think that? Now here he was, inside a metal thing. He didn't know enough about anything to understand what it was, but he did know he wasn't alone. He was sharing this strange place. It was like waking up in another family's house. Hello? Jake said. Who's talking? A child voice asked. Asked. Uh, the child sounded like a little... like... A boy Jake used to know in school. A boy who was always talking back to the teacher and getting himself in trouble. Oh, hi, Jake said. I'm Jake. Who are you? What's it to you? Um, I was just being friendly. Jake remembered learning that the way to deal with kids like this was to let them be as tough as they wanted to be. Sorry, I'm Andrew. The child's voice was rough. He didn't sound like he was saying his name. It sounded like he was throwing down a challenge. Hi, Andrew, Jake said. Why can't I see anything? Andrew demanded. You can't see the truck? Jake asked. If I could see the truck, do you think I'd say I can't see anything? Jake thought Andrew sounded ang angry, very angry. Sorry, Jake said. Um, so we're in the back of what I think might be a trash truck. We're with a lot of junk. Figures, Andrew said. How come? Jake asked. Story of my life. What do you mean? Andrew ignored the question. How come you can see and I can't? He sounded like he was gearing up for a, chan for a tantrum. I'm really sorry. I'm not sure, Jake said. I mean, I know we're in some kind of metal thing. I don't know, some kind of entity or something. I can see what's around it, but I don't know how I got here. And so I don't know how you got here. And I sure don't know why I can see and you can't. But maybe I can help you see. Do you know how you got here? Andrew was silent for a minute. Jake waited. Well, it might have had something to do with the stuff I was in. What stuff? Jake asked. How is it any of your business? Andrew snarled. 
Jake's side. It's not. I just thought it would be nice to be friends and friends get to know each other. So I just wondered what you meant by being in stuff. The truck ground to a stop and there was silence. I haven't had a friend in a long time, Andrew said. His tone was defensive, as if he was darling Jake's to make fun of him. D a darling? Daring Jake to make fun of him, sorry. I'm so sorry, Jake said. His memories were disjointed and muddled, but he remembered he'd had friends. That's awful. Jake wanted to know more, but he knew better than to keep asking questions. The back of the truck opened, and a guy in coveralls started unloading the junk. I could be your friend, Jake said. Why would you want to be my friend? I just like making friends, Jake said. So how do we do that? Do what? Make friends. Andrew made an exasperated puffing sound. Jeez, you're dense. Jake felt like he was making first contact with a new species, like in sci-fi movies he could remember watching. We talk to each other, tell each other things, and find out more about each other. And then we become friends, Jake said. He figured that was close enough. Like what things? Andrew asked. Whatever you want. Jake wanted to ask again about what Andrew meant by being in stuff, but he waited. Andrew was silent for a few seconds. Have you ever been so angry you just wanted everyone to know it? Jake thought about it and remembered a time he was really angry because he had to leave school. But why? It didn't really matter. I've been really angry, he said. But I guess I didn't need everyone to know it. But I had someone to talk to. Did you? No. Jake wasn't sure what to say, so he stayed quiet. Did you want to get back at the person you were angry with? Andrew asked. I don't think it was a person. I think it had to do with being sick or something. My memories are kind of fuzzy. Fuzzy. Yeah, so are mine, Andrew said. But I do remembering... But but I do remembering want, wanting... <laughs> does that make any sense? But I do remembering wanting to get back at someone who hurt me. I don't know if that made sense, but... Um, I think I attached myself to him. I got into his soul, made sure he couldn't move on when he should have died. I remember I wanted him to suffer the way he made me suffer, but I don't remember what he did. I just know I hung on, no matter what they did to him to try to save him. And I wanted him to hurt. At one point, Jake can hold back any longer. He blurted, that's terrible you felt so bad. Shut up, just shut up, Andrew yelled. I don't need your stupid sympathy, sorry. Several seconds passed. Then Andrew, Andrew had more to say. I remember they tried to kill him, but I wasn't going to let him go until I was ready. It's weird. I remember being so angry and determined, but I don't know why. It hurt Jake to be so close to this much hate, but he wouldn't have left if he could have. Andrew needed him. You're still there? Andrew asked Jake. Yes, I'm listening. You told me to shut up. Andrew laughed. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Jake was quiet. Then he said, So where is the person now? The one you're angry with? I'm not sure. I know I was in him when we got to this big place with lots of cool stuff. All I can remember after that is wanting to be everywhere. I can remember being all over the place and all kinds of things, and I remember this animatronic dog, Fetch. He broke down in a thunderstorm. Sucky toy. Not made well. Andrew made a raspberry sound. Then he sighed. So, I think I was in Fetch. Sort of. I think that's how I got here. I don't know why I think that. I just do. Jake stayed silent. He was still watching the man unload the truck. You can talk now, Andrew said. I don't know what to say, Jake said. I feel bad that you went through something that was really bad. The man reached for, Jack, uh, for Jake and Andrew's container. Jake had been wondering what to do about the man. He thought moving what... what they were in would startle the man, but now he didn't really have a choice. He didn't want the man to throw Andrew and him away, so Jake moved, which meant the thing they were in moved. Jake saw the man stare in alarm. Wanting to comfort the man, Jake reached out to touch his face. The man screamed and grabbed his head. Collapsing on the gravel behind the truck, the man's body began to wither like he was a sponge being wrung out by an invisible hand. As his body sucked in on itself, his eyes fell inward, disappearing, and black streaks ran down the man's cheeks. What just happened? Jake shouted. He jumped out of the truck and stared at the, de at the, at the bald man's body. I can't see, dummy, Andrew snapped. What are you talking about? 
I just thought about touching a guy's face and he died. Why did he die? Jake realised he was screaming, but he couldn't help himself. Why are you asking me? Andrew was sounding defensive again. The other guy died too. I just remembered, Jake said. It's probably me, Andrew said. Could it be Fetch, the dog? Jake asked. Nah, it's me, I bet. You want to kill people? No. Then why? I just want to scare people, okay? Like, you know, give them a zap. The zap is killing them. Well, that wasn't what I wanted. Okay. Jake thought a second. So if what you're doing isn't doing what you want, maybe it's doing something someone else wants. Maybe something else is in here with us. In this thing, you mean? Yeah, like a hitchhiker. Or like a flea on a dog. That's stupid, and you said. You were a hitchhiker on the man who killed you. Why can't someone else hitchhike with us? Andrew was silent for a second. Then he said, It just sounds dumb. The thing is, Jake said, that if you did do it, somehow, whatever is causing you to do it could be in everything you got into. I infected them. I remember now. What? I infected everything I threw my anger at. Okay. So everything you infected could hurt people. Innocent people. Hey, I'm not like that. I just wanted to hurt the bad guy. But you said you infected stuff with your anger. You didn't think that would hurt them? Shut up. Fine, I'll shut up. But we're going to find all the stuff you infected. How are you going to do that? You won't help me? Why should I? Jake thought for a second and then tried something. He wasn't sure he could do it. But yes, he could. He could feel Andrew's thoughts. He'd be able to find the stuff Andrew infected, even without Andrew's help. Huh, interesting. So clearly they're inside the Stitch Wraith, right? And and this was the basis for, like, Golden Duo. Oh, no, no the, the, the beginning of Golden Duo was uh, the new kid, wasn't it? Yeah. But this kind of further further clarifies it. Huh, this is very interesting, because I know a little bit about Jake because I've read things in the future. <laughs> uh, and in the far future, we're actually going to get... Well, actually, not that far future now. In the future, we're going to get a story about Andrew too. So this is this is very interesting. Larson sat at his desk, ignoring everything else in the office. On a normal, on any normal day, he'd have trouble uh, concentrating while Roberts sprayed ha- air freshener toward Powell's desk, while Powell bellowed at Roberts for spraying Powell's garlic heavy meatball sandwich, while two drunk bikers hauled in for fighting continue trying to assault each other, and while the rest of the people in the office either talked on the phone or to one another. But today wasn't a normal day. Today, a marching band could have been doing formations between the desks, and Larson wouldn't have cared. Today, he was onto something. Or at least he thought he was. Bending over the papers and photos in front of him, guarding them with his elbows so he didn't have to explain his ideas to anyone else, Larson first poured over the photos of the Phineas Taggart crime scene. They showed exactly what he remembered seeing when he'd arrived at the factory to crazy scientist laboratory conversion weeks before. Viewing the scene had been like looking at a modern-day Frankenstein's lab, the room where the scientist's remains had been found, Uh, had been packed full of scanning equipment modified in incomprehensible ways and hooked up to the strangest collection of junk he'd ever seen. Much of the junk had been just as mystifying as the equipment modifications, gears and hinges and mannequin parts and antique contraptions that looked like medieval torture devices. But one collection of junk had been combined in an especially disturbing way, looking as Looking at it had twisted Larson's insides and put his blood in a deep freeze. Because he'd been so rattled by what he was looking at, he hadn't looked at it closely. Now, he'd realised he'd been an idiot. He should have looked harder. If he had, he'd have figured out what have what the stitch wraith was a lot faster. Or would he have? Even if he'd put it together, mightn't it have take him some t- taken him some time to come to terms with it? Although he was sure now, he wasn't totally sure, because he was sure of what was totally insane. If he was truly certain, he'd be telling his colleagues. Instead, he was peering at the evidence as if it was a treasure he, was, he wasn't willing to share. Larson looked at the junk, conglon... Cong- cong- <laughs> Larson looked at the junk conglomeration 
there we go, big word, that had so horrified him, I'm, pr I'm proud of saying that. And he knew he was looking at the beginnings of the strange figure he was looking for. In the photo he held, the doll's head could be seen only from one for, uh, from the side. That's how Larson had seen it in Phineas's laboratory as well. This is why Larson hadn't immediately recognized, recognized the stretched face when he'd seen the picture in the chief's envelope. But that head, he was sure it was the head, was attached to a metal endoskeleton. Okay, so the mysterious figure was always described as wearing a hooded cloak, but Larson remembered seeing a long and volumin voluminous hooded trench coat in Phineas's clothing. That could easily have been misidentified as a cloak. Larson set down the photo and he began reading through the inventory list from Phineas's property. Running his finger down the list, he read the items aloud under his breath. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is going. <laughs> he stopped at the tenth item down. There it was, one robotic dog, disassembled, manufactured by Fazbear Entertainment. Larson looked at the endoskeleton again. It seemed to have an addition. So part of that dog could have been so part of that dog could, could have been used on the endoskeleton. Okay, so we have an animatronic endoskeleton linked to a part that came from a Fazbear Entertainment robotic dog. Was he making too much of a leap connecting the dots? The dog connected to Fazbear Entertainment, which was connected to the Freddy's murders, and the dog connected to the thing with the sketch face. So that meant Larson's current invest investigation could be connected to the Freddy murders. A paper airplane hit the top of Larson's bent head. He slapped at it and frowned, looking up. Earth to Larson, Robert said. The detective's close-set grey eyes were aimed at the photos Larson was shielding. I asked what you were doing, thinking. About what? Stupid stuff, probably. No way Larson was going to tell his straight arrow partner, Weir of, of Tweet. <coughs> oh my gosh. Why is my voice going? <laughs> I said Weir as well, it's Weir. Oh, I'm sorry. Wearer of tweed jackets with leather elbow patches and too proud owner of a perfectly groomed goatee about his fledging theory. Want to grab some lunch? No thanks. Robert stared at Larson for a moment. Larson stared back, his face as blank as he could make it. Okay, Robert said. Larson shot the paper plane back across his desk to Robert's. Nice one, he said, hoping to distract Robert's from any suspicion that Larson was onto something. Robert's was almost as proud of his aerodynamic paper aeroplanes as he was of facial hair. Robert's grinned. Thanks. He got up and strolled away from his desk. Larson waited until Roberts was gone, and then he stood. He needed to get over to the evidence locker. He'd chew on his theory on the way. The old stone building had originally housed the city police department, but this was now the department's annex, where the more obscure functions of the police department were carried out, and where the, all the records and evidence were kept. In the evidence locker's musty basement aisles, Larson stood on a stepladder, and pulled a stack of three battered boxes from a shelf above his head, setting them on the floor. The all three boxes side by side, Larson squatted in front of them and took off their lids. He coughed when the persistent odour of smoke wafted up from the boxes. Then he peered into each box. Larson's heart rate was in onto something mode, thumping loud and fast in his chest. The fire, so far in the past it was almost ancient history in the department, had never been solved. Larson didn't know a lot about it, but he did know the fire was connected to one of the founders of Fazbear Entertainment. There we go. Ooh. His idea was that if the Stitch Wraith was connected to Fazbear Entertainment and was seen at the site of the fire, the Stitch Wraith might have been looking for something that had put into evidence years ago. He didn't think it was that much of a stretch to reach this conclusion. But the first three boxes didn't do much to bolster his theory. He replaced their lids and climbed up the stepladder. He climbed back down, shifted the ladder, climbed back up again and pulled another stack of boxes from the shelves. This time, he took the lids off one at a time. When he took the lid off the third box, he raised his eyebrows and nodded. Grimm hadn't been back to the railroad yard since he'd seen the mysterious figure prying loose parts from the tracks. Something about that figure had done more than just make his teeth hurt. It had made him want to dig a very deep hole and crawl into it. 
Since he didn't have a shovel or the strength to dig such a hole, Grimm had decided instead to move his usual hangout place to the far end of town, where abandoned factories rubbed shoulders with several stalwood, stalwood, stalwood <laughs> old neighbourhoods and the west dock of the lake. He found a rusted but sturdy shed just outside of one of the abandoned factories, a factory that had been so recently vacated that a shabby forklift still squatted nearby. The shed, although watertight and clean, hadn't been discovered by anyone else like Grimm, so he set up the house under a long wide shelf below a dirty window. Because he knew others could be attracted to such deserted locales, he was happy that he found a shelf in his shed. Wait, he, he was happy that he found the shelf in his shed, made a suitable lounging platform for keeping an eye on his surroundings, sorry. And it was a good thing he kept an eye out, because on the, his third night in the shed, he spotted the mysterious figure, happy that he was at least in his usual crazy thoughts tonight. He still had trouble continuing to breathe as he watched the figure drag a bag through a double garage door size opening in the boxy metal factory shell. What compelled him to follow the figure to see where it went? Was it that curiosity he felt the last time he'd seen the figure, or was it perhaps some self-destructive urge? Maybe it was that crazy voice in his head. Whatever it was, Grimm found himself scurrying stealth stealthily, uh, and perhaps a bit unsteadily, toward the opening into which the figure disappeared. When he reached it, he hesitated for a second, questioning the wisdom of his actions, but he went through the opening anyway. Preparing to be jumped the second he entered, Grimm was surprised and relieved to find himself in an empty triangle, uh, not triangle, triple garage sized space that widened into another space beyond. And he was even more surprised and pleased to hear movement in that second space and see enough light to pick his way over the debris strewn um, concrete floor. The dragging movement he heard was disconcerting and would have sent any normal, running, any normal person running for his life. Grimm, however, hadn't been normal for several years. When Grimm reached the front edge of the second space, he paused. He waited, listening until the scrape and shoosh sound of the dragging bag was far enough away to make him feel fairly certain he could follow without running into his quarry. It didn't take long for him to feel like he should make his move. Taking a deep breath for courage, he took another step, and he stopped. He was in a huge square expanse, an expanse with flat walls and high ceilings, an expanse filled with piles of junk. He figured this was the main floor of the old factory. It was at least a couple thousand square feet in size and its high ceiling peaked at a blank of skylights which allowed murky daylight to brighten the area. Grimm realised he stood on an elevated rim of the floor, a rim about 15 feet wide. It ran around the perimeter of the huge space. Several sets of concrete stairs with metal stair rails led down to a level about six feet lower. On that level, on one side of the cavernous square, a massive dirty blue trash compactor was set part way into the concrete floor. It had a filthy, scarred chute that led from the elevated rim down into its metal bowels. It was quiet and still now, but Grimm could imagine it in action, pummeling trash and then tipping it out into a shallow concrete pit near the end of its lethal enclosure. Near the trash compactor chute, a, a small shelf hung on the wall. The shelf held a pot with two bright red flowers shaped like starfish. Ooh, there we go. <laughs> Grimm couldn't imagine anything looking more out of place than those two flowers did next to the powerful eater of trash. Grimm blanked, uh, blinked and watched the cloaked figure drag his bag to one of the junk piles. He couldn't see what was in the bag, but he glimpsed a doll's arm hanging from the opening. Dressed in a bright blue dress with equally bright pink ruffles, the arm looked so innocent and sweet. It didn't belong in this room of metal and mechanical junk. Nothing belonged in such a room. Because the junk in this room wasn't just any junk. It was the junk of nightmares, the junk of blood-curdling histories. The junk in this room was a collection of the worst mechanical monstrosities imaginable, spotting the remains he'd seen removed from the tracks. Grimm also saw the carcass of a robotic dog and several partial animatronic characters. It looked like someone had blown up a factory of creepy robotic toys and then piled up their remains. Not even the crazy voices in his head could convince Grimm to stay in this room. 
he backed out and retreated as quietly and as fast as he could to his rusty shed. Jake, aware that he was being watched but not concerned about it because he could sense the soul and the character of the person watching, emptied the latest bag of infected items on the shortest pile in the abandoned factory. It made him sad to see the doll's arm. Well, all of it made him sad, actually. Toys shouldn't have been things that held horror and anger and fear. They should have been containers for joy and love and laughter. Ever since Andrew had told Jake about all the infected things, Jake had been using the thing uh, he and Andrew were in to gather all the stuff Andrew had infected. When he first had the idea to do that, he wasn't sure how he'd, exact how he'd actually do it. He didn't know what he and Andrew were in then, just that it was made of metal and it could move. But then he understood he was in an animatronic endoskeleton run by a battery pack and he understood he was looking at the world through a doll's eyes. None of that felt strange to him. The only thing he thought was funny was that the thing they were in was wearing a hooded trench coat. Going around in a trench coat felt really silly. And it was hard to go over all of this in, the, in this thing too. Harder than he'd thought it would be. Andrew had infected so much stuff. Jake hadn't understood how tiring it was going to be to use his will to get the locations from Andrew's mind and make the animatronic go over the place and finding the stuff. Jake was feeling so worn out, like he had before he had left his little boy body. He wasn't sure he could keep doing what he needed to do. Maybe he should just give up and let go. Jake hadn't done anything wrong. Why did he have to be the one to fix Andrew's mess? Wasn't he a good boy? Didn't he deserve to have some fun? I think we need peanuts, don't you Jake? A smiling man asked. A crowd cheered and a different man called out, Hot dogs, get your hot dog here. Maybe a hot dog too, the smiling man asked. Jake froze with the empty bag in his hand. Was that a memory? Did he just have a memory? He cocked his head. Since he'd been in this metal endoskeleton, he hadn't had a sense of smell. But now he felt like he was inhaling the aromas of peanuts and hot dogs. He could also feel something new. His face, or the face of what he was in, suddenly felt warm, like he was outside in bright sunlight instead of where he was, inside in a dingy factory. This had to be a memory, because it for sure wasn't happening right now. It felt like a memory, and the man in his memory had, this, had said his name. No, wait, it wasn't just a man, it was his dad. Jake had just experienced a memory of his dad. What are the flowers for? Andrew asked. Jake ignored him. He was concentrating. The memory, if that's what it was, had felt really good. Jake wanted more of it. He closed his eyes and focused on the smells and the sounds and the sensations. Let's have both, Jake's dad said. He motioned and a man came over with a tray full of roasted peanuts in small bags. Jake felt himself settle into his little boy body. He looked out through the little boy's eyes and he saw a big field of grass and a huge crowd of people. Jake, what about the flowers? Andrew asked. Jake didn't answer. Instead, he picked up a watering can he'd left under the shelf holding the flower pot. He walked over to water the flowers. At the same time, he returned to his memory. As Jake watched his dad exchange money for one of the bags from the tray, understanding came back to him. For the first time since he'd become aware of be being in the animatronic he was in now, he fully knew himself as he truly was. He was Jake, the little boy, and he was relieving, reliving an afternoon at a baseball game with his dad. It felt so real, and Jake began to feel as if he was being sucked out of the thing he was in. He felt like he was a puff of smoke, and he was being borne by an air current away from the being that had contained him. He could feel himself being pulled into the memory itself, and he intuitively understood that if he was enveloped in the memory, he could stay in that happy place forever. The crack of a bat resounded and the crowd rose to its feet, cheering. Get your glove up, Jake, his dad shouted. Jake raised his baseball-gloved hand, and he drifted even further from the animatronic he'd been in. Jake? Where are you going? Jake! Andrew shouted. Jake realised he could easily relax into this wonderful memory and allow the whole of who he was to be extracted from the animatronic that contained him and Andrew. He could stop trying so hard. He could go have fun. Jake? Andrew called out. But... Jake couldn't leave Andrew. His new friend had never known love, and if Jake left, Andrew would be lost forever. Jake couldn't let that happen. 
Jake w looked hard at the piles of trash in the compactor. He forced the memory from his mind. By putting his whole attention on what was here now, he wiped the memory away from his awareness like he was erasing a blackboard. As he did, he settled back into his place in the animatronic. He watered the flowers and he ignored Andrew's repeated questions. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, th this is... Ooh, okay, this is getting complicated now. This is getting really complicated. What is going on? Okay, that's very weird. That's very weird, especially if you read The Real Jake. That's kind of weird. Larson pulled his brown sedan just inside the gaping doorway of the abandoned factory. He turned off the engine and looked around. A murky twilight was beginning to slip down the mountains on the far side of the lake, threatening to swallow the remainder of the day's light. Larson figured it would be dark in about an hour. Looking in the rearview mirror, he noticed a couple of security lights mounted on tall poles, standing like senators, uh, guarding the factory and the dock extending out into the lake beyond. Some of that light would make it in through this door, he figured, and he'd need the light if he didn't start moving. Get on with it, Larson commanded himself. Picking up his portable radio and tucking it in his jacket pocket, he reached for the plastic garbage bag into which he stuffed the evidence he'd purloined from the evidence locker. It had taken some fast talking to get it past the sergeant on duty. He couldn't explain what he needed the evidence for because he hadn't quite convinced himself that he actually needed it. His intuition said he did. His logical mind was laughing hysterically. Getting out of the sedan, holding the garbage bag, Larson looked around again. He waited and listened. Unless a situation was pressing, he always liked to take a minute to assess where he was, take it in, feel it. It wasn't going to require a minute to assess this place. In just five seconds, Larson had felt enough. What he felt was so strong it hit him like an invisible force, and he had to grab open. He had to grab the open sedan door to steady himself. Larson wasn't sure he believed in evil, but if evil did exist, he'd have said it resided here, or at least it was visiting. He cocked his head and listened for another few seconds. He heard nothing but the sounds of cars passing on the streets beyond the building and a couple of crows cawing from atop a corroded shed about 10 feet from the factory's outer walls. Wait, was that a movement he'd seen? He, look, he turned to look at a yellowed, dirty window in the shed. No, nothing was there. Larson quietly closed the sedan's door. The space he, ha he was in looked big enough for two more cars like his, and beyond it, another larger room beckoned. It was dim inside the old factory, but Larson could see well enough. He could hear too, and what he heard told him where he needed to go. From the far side of the expanse that opened up ahead of him, scraping and rustling sounds wa warred with plinks, thuds and clatters. Someone was in there. Larson stopped and wrapped the plastic bag's ties around his waist, uh, around his wrist. Once it was secured, he drew his gun. Extending the automatic in front of him, he crept forward. A whisper came from what felt like a few feet away just up ahead. Larson went rig rigid. Someone was close enough that he could hear them whisper. Why couldn't he see them? He took a breath, steadied himself, then strode to the edge of a huge room dominated by a massive blue trash compactor. The compactor contained a pile of electronic and metal debris. And next to the compactor chute, his quarry stood. A strange cloaked figure, Larson muttered. Yep, there it was. Larson pivoted left and right, trying to find the source of the whisper. But he was alone on a wide concrete platform that encircled the factory floor. Alone with the strange cloaked figure. The figure didn't seem to care about Larson's presence though. It looked to be sorting trash. It was emptying a large garbage bag. Larson watched gears, hinges and tangles of wire drop from the bag. Then he saw the bag let go of the distorted face of a fox wearing a pirate's eye patch. The disconnected arms of a fox followed, one arm ending in a hook. Foxy. Larson recognised the animatronic from Freddy's. He was on the right track. The broken foxy and what looked like other... Robotic de debris slid down the compactor chute into the square belly of the steel beast. When the remains hit the sides of the compactor, the clang brought Larson to his senses. 
Stop, he shouted at the figure. The figure turned and took a step toward Larson. Larson raised his gun and squared his stance. Leave him alone, Jake said to Andrew. Jake had no sense of himself as an individual body now, but he could still act like one when he tried really hard, like now. He threw his non-existent shoulder into Andrew's equally non-existent chest, and the two of them began fighting for control over the animatronic container that held them. The animatronic lurched back and forth in what Jake was sure must have looked like a spastic dance to the detective who was pointing his gun. Let me take care of him, Andrew shouted. I, I can stop him. His choppy words reflected the effort he was expending, trying to wrest control of the animatronic from Jake. Andrew had already proven he could command it at least a little, because Jake hadn't taken the step toward the cop. But you'll hurt him, Jake reminded Andrew, shoving harder with his imaginary shoulder. Andrew grunted, then said, panting, We have to get rid of this stuff, or it will hurt more people. Jake concentrated and raised his imaginary hand. Yes, but not by killing someone else. Frowning and throwing every bit of his will into what he wanted to do, Jake was able to overcome Andrew. The animatronic skeletal hand came up and slapped the compactor's start button. Then Jake took a solid grip on Andrew and prepared to do what had to be done. Larson flinched when the compactor started. The sudden bass rumble and reverberation momentarily stupefied him. Then, in the quarter second he spent to process that, he got his next shock. The figure threw itself into the chute. From where he stood on the upper platform of the big room, Larson was able to see the endoskeleton of the figure land in the spinning, thrashing heap of metal. Immediately, the part started to consume the figure as everything churned inside of the compactor. A metal press began shoving its way into the writhing mass of the junk. Larson started to run toward the chute. But the, sp the, but the press ploughed through the junk faster than he could cover the yards between him and the switch. It moved steadily, inexorably, through the it twisted mound with a roaring screech that sounded like a crash between... Oh my gosh, sorry. That sounded like a clash between a behemoth <laughs> and defenceless creatures wailing in their death throes. It looked that way too. So much of the junk in the pile were parts of robotic toys and animatronics that it was easy to hu humanize, sorry, I was going to say humanitize for some reason, humanize the pile and see it as a mass grave being defiled by the powerful metallic arm of a monster. All Larson could do was stand and watch the compactors destroy the parts that had made up the cloaked figure and everything it had been collecting. As soon as Jake and Andrew landed in the compacting junk, the baseball field returned to Jake's consciousness. He heard his dad laugh, and he tasted a fresh peanut, and he felt himself begin to float free again. Jake resisted, focusing intensely on the junk surrounding him. He couldn't leave Andrew. The memory was so strong, though. Even as he put all his attention on the junk, his dad's face and the warm sun buoyed him. Andrew, grab my hand, he shouted. Andrew reached up, as soon as he did, too began to disconnect from the endoskeleton. Jake was so relieved, so thrilled, that he let the memory embrace him again. He and Andrew both began to move away from their physical confines, as if they were being carried by a sleek, swift sailboat toward that wonderful sunny day in the baseball field, but only for a few seconds. Then Andrew was tugged downward. He was being yanked toward the infected robotic parts below. No, Jake shouted. He tried to hang on to Andrew, but the force resisting him was so strong. Jake looked down. Below him, a bizarre presence of colour and movement was brawling with everything in the compactor, including the animatronic Jake and Andrew were in. This chaotic collection of muddy, brown, dirty, yellow and shocking red pulsed with rage. Come on, Andrew, Jake called. I'm trying, but I can't. Something's got me. Andrew called back. Jake felt like he and Andrew were being stretched between two forces. From somewhere beyond this dirty factory, the good feelings of Jake's memory boosted them. From below, density roiled around Andrew, keeping them anchored. Jake thought the density was Andrew's pain. Then he realised he was wrong. It had nothing to do with Andrew. Andrew, Jake said, there's something else in here with us. 
It's him, Andrew cried out. He sounded terrified. Jake focused harder on his memory. He ate a hot, salty peanut, and he looked into his dad's warm, happy gaze. Larson couldn't move. He was mesmerised by the compacting junk and by the inexplicable light rising from it. What was that? He realised he was still aiming at the crumpling, deconstructing stitch wraith and holstered his gun. He rubbed his eyes. Was he seeing things? It looked like a faint aurora borealis uh, was rising up from the convulsing junk. Yes, Jake cried. Andrew was breaking loose. Then, out of the nearly c fully compressed junk, the contorted but, unident uh, but identified shape of what looked like a burned skeletal man thrust upward, with ashy, see uh, with ashy see through skin that revealed dried up but still quivering organs, the man thing looked like a creature from hell. Its limbs broken and bursting through the cracked skin, its face misshapen, its torso twisted. The creature took shape while Jake watched. No way is this Afton. No way. When Jake saw the man's bones crack, fold, and reshape into what appeared to be rabbit ears, he yelled, Andrew, come on. Rabbit ears unfolded from the back of the creature's skull and stretched upright, and the creature heaved itself toward Andrew. Jake had hold of Andrew, and he was sure all but the just the tiniest amount of Andrew's essence was in his grasp, but the creature was trying to keep hold of his friend. There is no... W what? Sorry, this is a big... This is like the big reaction I'm, I'm having to this story right now. This was... Okay, wait, ha we might talk about this in a bit, but that must be the room in 1280, right? Right? <laughs> A.K.A. William Afton? Okay. No, Jake shouted. Jake focused again on his good memory, but this time it didn't loosen Andrew anymore. It must it just started taking Jake away from Andrew. Jake couldn't let that happen. He was going to allow Andrew he wasn't going to allow Andrew to be hurt anymore. Jake had to stay and fight. Blocking out anything good he'd ever felt, Jake anchored himself back into the animatronic. He faced the enemy in the compactor. As soon as Jake released his memory, the creature shifted its attention to Mike, uh, to Jake, sorry. Jake felt the creature claw at him. It felt like he was being mauled and pummeled by a force filled with the never-ending need to inflict pain. But he didn't give in to it. Throwing everything he had into his effort and drawing on the paper of his memory, Jake turned himself into a massive bat of intention and he swung away, knocking Andrew loose from the evil that held him. Andrew, suddenly free, was sucked away, and he vanished. Jake, however, couldn't untangle himself from the relentless rabbit creature. He fell back into the seething junk and was engulfed in blackness. The trash compactor opened, and Larson watched it tip upward and disgorge its flattened mass of broken animatronic and robotic pieces. From above the compactor, what looked like a dying ember fizzled and fell back into the compressed junk. What just happened? Larson asked the room. It didn't answer. Larson shook his head and looked around. His gaze landed on a pot with two red flowers shaped like starfish. It sat at a, at, a, at a tilt against the upper lip of the compactor, unaffected by the pressure that had just smashed through the rest of the bizarre debris the figure had collected. <clears throat> Larson thought about going down the stairs to poke around the compressed junk, but he didn't see the point. Whether he was right or wrong about what had just happened, it was done. So he turned and headed back to his sedan. There, he dropped the trash bag he'd carried inside onto the floor next to the sedan. He wasn't sure what to do with it. He'd planned on using it as a way to communicate to the stitch race. But now, he leaned into his sedan and pulled out a mini tape recorder. The uh, stitch race appears to be dead, he said into the recorder. He felt like an idiot. Dead wasn't the right word for what he just witnessed, was it? And what exactly did he see? He took a breath and spoke into the recorder. I saw an animatronic endoskeleton with a doll's head and some kind of battery, wearing a hooded trench coat, putting stuff in a trash compactor and pulverising it. It also destroyed itself. 
I think the stuff in the compactor came from the Frasbear Entertainment Distribution Center and also from the site where the serial killer, William Afton, the one notorious for wearing a rabbit costume, died. What? <laughs> we actually got William Afton's name in a Fazbear Fright book? Are you kidding me? Okay. He stopped the recorder and thought for a second. Oh, what the hell? He started recording again. I don't believe the ghosts. But after what I just saw, I'm not so sure about anything anymore. I mean, from where I'm stood, I swore it looked like the Stitch Wraith was an animatronic contraption. And there was some kind of supernatural light coming out of it, like a ghost. Like the animatronic was haunted by ghosts. Maybe the ghosts were the kids Afton killed, or maybe it was Afton himself. He stopped the recording and sighed. Who was going to believe any of this? Tossing the recorder in his sedan, Larson turned his back to the inner part of the factory and looked out through the exterior, opening to the lake. The sky above the mountains was tinged with the faintest hint of pink. Maybe he should take Ryan hiking the next time he got to spend time with his son. Behind the unsuspecting Larson, the compacted trash began to move, making a quiet rustling sound Larson didn't hear the junk rose from the trash compactor and began to arrange itself into an upright being. As it began to assemble itself, the being sucked in all the remaining junk and debris in the factory. However, it also rejected some of the waste. Just as it started to form, the vaguely man-shaped structure of trash shuddered for a second, and then it ejected part of itself. A, mu mu a, mu mutilated, <laughs> a mutilated mass of robotic endoskeleton and crumpled fabric spewed through the air and landed several feet away. When the rejected detritus, oh my gosh, there's so many weird words, uh, hit the concrete, it lay still. The rest of the trash from the compactor continued its transfiguration. It formed itself out of animatronic body parts, but not in any logical way. They were joining all hay haywire. Heads were being used as joints, arms as legs and legs as arms. A torso formed from the hips and chest and belly of three animatronics, but each part was put in the wrong place. Hands were inserted at random all over the structure. Woven through all these misplaced pieces were wires and gears, which created a lamp labyrinthine uh, circulatory system connecting hinges to gears and screws and nails to eyes and noses and mouths. With each additional piece clamping into pace, place, um, the miscreation stood taller and taller until it was nearly 15 feet tall. Then, looming over the detective, it leaned to the side and lifted a macabre macabre <laughs> head up to the neck made from shins the neck uh, oh my gosh the head like the rest of the being was made from animatronic parts fingers toes wires hinges within those parts two gaping black holes looked out at the world with pure malevolence and from the top of the unnatural structure what looked like two rabbit ears made of even more animatronic parts unfolded and canted forward. They were aimed right at the detective. Oh, 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 oh. oh, that was an eventful one. Oh, I love that. The worst part about this is that's the end for me right now, today. Uh, I mean, we're, we're getting the next part in like a week, but that's amazing. That's so good, okay. Why haven't I read, read these earlier? <laughs> Why? Um, like, this is the best part of the Fazbear Frights books now. Um, very interesting. We got William Afton's name in Fazbear Frights books. So he exists in this universe. So it's it, it might not even be a different universe. It's literally just people paralleling each other. Like, for example, uh, Pete in Step Closer... Um, might literally just be a parallel, but not in a parallel universe. Like, Pete exists in the same universe as the game universe, but he's just a parallel to Michael Afton. Huh. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Or it is just a massive parallel, and William Afton still exists in this parallel universe. 
I actually that might be that might be it. <laughs> but either way, I did not expect the man in room twelve eighty slash William Afton to be in the story. Wow. Okay, that was a big reveal. Um, and also, he's making a, a like a massive rabbit structure animatronic thing. I uh, I wonder if that is who the arm is in the security breach trailer at the end. That's that's possible. I think that's possible. Larson heard it before he saw it, and when he did hear it, he couldn't believe how it managed to form behind him without him hearing it. The sounds were ear-splitting. Larson's initial thought was that a train was barreling down on him. The clatter, rumble and blast and shriek that now made him whirl around defied his ability to process the noise. He had no better success with what he was seeing, but he couldn't even try to process that. He just ran barreling out of the shelter of the factory, leaving his sedan and the garbage bag behind, Larson raced towards the dock. Realising it provided no cover, he veered back toward the building, to the overhang that sheltered an old forklift. Crouching next to the, next to the forklift, he peeked into the factory. Yep, yeah, he wasn't going mad. He'd seen what he thought he'd seen, but it hadn't started chasing him yet. It seemed to be deciding what form to take. It continued to coalesce into the most abominable thing Larson had ever encountered. Transfixed by the strange mass consolidating in front of him, Larson's feet were rooted to the ground. His awareness, however, uh, honed by years of detective work, reached out beyond the scrap metal beast. He spotted subtle movement near the trash compactor. It was little more than a twitch at first, but then the twitch turned into a vibration and the stitch wraith climbed out of the tight wad of trash. Huh. Okay, so they're separate entities? Okay. Still a little disoriented from his battle with the rabbit creature and his temporarily compressed state, Jake wanted only to curl up and sleep someplace safe. He was so tired, but he couldn't rest yet. The man Jake had seen earlier, the detective, was nearby and he was in trouble. As soon as Jake climbed out of the trash compactor, he had full awareness of what, he, of what was going on in the factory. Part of his awareness came from the normal senses. He could see the trash monster building itself up larger and larger. He could hear the clanking, thumping and clattering of metal latching onto metal. The rest of his awareness, however, came from something he didn't understand. He just knew the detective was nearby and was in terrible danger. Jake also knew something else. He knew he was in danger too. Completely against his will, Jake's metal body began to skim across the concrete toward the trash being. It felt like Jake was caught in an alien spaceship's tractor beam, except he wasn't being towed into the sky, he was being sucked into the horrible metal man thing. Jake immediately put all his strength into fighting the pull. After just a few seconds he was able to stop his forward motion. Around him animatronic parts and trash whizzed past and glommed into the massive body forming from the garbage. Jake, though, stayed fast. Uh, Jake, though, stayed fast, committing himself to remaining separate from the evil entity. And because he was Jake, a boy who tried uh, to help anyone who needed it, he also extended his intention to the other animatronic debris being vacuumed up by the junkyard fiend. He did all he could to save the other parts from falling under the thing's control. He'd managed to hold back a few arms and legs and joints and screws, but suddenly he felt the resistance of, of mangled metallic skeletal remains. Something was fighting against him. It wanted to be absorbed by the whole. Jake managed to keep himself planted as he turned to see what had enough self-awareness that it would choose to join the bulging trash being. For a few seconds, the debris rolling around him remained locked in chaotic movement. But then he spied a battered, rusting, vaguely female-shaped endoskeleton with a long neck crawling away from the other rubbish. Jake immediately tried to reach whatever was controlling the girl endoskeleton. Let me save you, he called to her with his mind. At first he got no response, but then his mind was filled with the sound of high-pitched laughter. It was a creepy cackling that skittered through his whole being. Before Jake could react to the sound, and whatever it meant, the, girl's en the girl endoskeleton's crawl turned into a disturbingly quick slither. Scraping across the floor, the girl endoskeleton shot towards Jake. Is this the puppet? Am I missing something? <laughs> is this the puppet? No way is it the puppet. Jake's inner resources were a little played out, given that he was still fighting the tug of the trash monster. So he could do little to resist when the girl endoskeleton surprisingly sprang off the ground and hit him full on, knocking him to the ground. 
Jake couldn't feel the impact, of course, but it still stunned him. For a few seconds, he couldn't move. He found himself eye to eye with a corroded face whose mouth was stretched into a poisonous smile that looked anything but friendly. Now nah, this is the puppet. Now nah, what? What? No way. I mean, we haven't had anything about the puppet in the other stories yet, so there's no way this is the puppet. Really? Well, okay. The smile supercharged Jake's need to get free. He immediately tried to throw off his attacker. But she didn't budge. Instead, she pinned him with extraordinary strength and her round, animatronic eyes started to glow white hot. The glaring light began to bore through Jake's doll's eyes, se oh, searing into him, reaching deep inside. The moment the light drilled into him, Jake felt the same evil he'd fought in the trash compactor. Only this evil felt stronger, like it was the core of what Jake had sensed in the things Andrew had infected. Jake also felt something else. Some of that badness was inside of him. He hadn't noticed it before, but now it was unmistakable. A piece of the evil he'd battled, cold and cruel, had been hiding in Jake's spirit. Just as it had, uh, had hitched a ride in Andrew, it had apparently burrowed its way into Jake as well. Jake didn't like having the nasty girl endoskeleton so close to him, but he was happy for her to take away the yuck he could feel within him. It was leaving now, returning to its source, the girl thing drawing the energy out of him with her burning gaze. Jake felt it the instant the evil left him, but even if he hadn't felt it, he'd have known. The girl endoskeleton looked somehow brighter now, less rusty. Taking back that part of her made her, uh, had made her stronger. As if acknowledging Jake's awareness, the girl thing cocked her metal skull and winked at him. It was a slow motion wink, filled with what looked like gleeful triumph. Then the girl endoskeleton let go of Jake and flew backward, allowing herself to be absorbed into the horrid metal giant. Huh, okay. Mesmerised by the bizarre osmosis of robotic parts, including one full female-shaped endoskeleton that attacked the stitch race before it releasing itself to the trash amalgamation, Larson hadn't managed to move from where he did. Now, however, the trash thing took a step forward, and it stared right at Larson. The moment the rabbit-shaped fusion of trash met Larson's gaze, Larson was able to accept what he had known when he'd first watched the monster pull itself together. The thing was Afton. Even though the rabbit was made up of disturbingly arranged animatronic parts and was twice a normal man's size, it ex 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 it air eh, it exuded. I've never heard that word before. It exuded William Afton's unmistakable energy. In a way, the patchwork face resembled photos Larson had seen of the serial killer, as if Afton had the power to shape other material into his own countenance. All right, yeah, he probably he does. Afton's amalgamation took another step forward. Larson, appalled by his stupid inaction, muttered, crap. He looked around. If he ran now, he could slip between the next building to the north and get away. But... He looked beyond the immediate buildings and the lake. This district was surrounded by old neighbourhoods, the kind of neighbourhoods with, uh, with two-storey houses, gnarled oak trees and children. Ryan's voice spoke in his head. Teacher says dads are like superheroes, but you're not. Superheroes don't break promises. Ryan was right. Superheroes didn't break promises, and Larson wanted to be Ryan's superhero. Today, he could do that by keeping his promise to the city, his promise to protect and serve. He was not going to run away. He had to stop this thing before it got out. But how? Larson looked around. He catalogued what he saw. The factory, currently incubating a creature from the underworld. Dock and lake behind the factory. An empty field to the left of the factory, beyond which lay houses in which little boys like his, Ryan, were playing video games, building forts, doing homework, or wishing their dads were at home. How could he fight something powered by such evil? Before he could answer that question, the creature that looked like both a man-shaped pile of junk and a deformed rabbit turned and went deeper into the factory. What was it doing? Larson crept out from behind the forklift and sid sidled through the entryway. Reaching his sedan, he crouched and listened. He noticed the bag of parts he had left on the ground by his open driver's side door. He grabbed the bag. He had a feeling he might need it. Inside the building, the thing crunched and huffed. Looping the bag around his wrist, as he'd done earlier, Larson ran toward the sound. Although following the sound was easy, understanding it was harder. The noises Larson was hearing kept changing. Maybe they shifted when the thing's parts shifted. 
Sometimes the sound was a chittering noise. Sometimes it was a crackle. Sometimes it was the fingernails on a chalkboard, cater wall of metal, being torn from metal. It was always something that made Larson forget to breathe. But he didn't stop moving, he couldn't. Following the sounds, he went past the trash compacting room and found himself in a wide hallway. A series of what looked like storage rooms or equipment rooms opened up off the hallway. From the now squalling and skidding sounds ahead of him, he knew he was going in the right direction. The skidding developed into, oh sorry, the skidding devolved into a snarling wet popping sound. It reminded Larson of the autos, autopsies sorry, he sometimes had to attend. A corpse made a similar sound when its ribcage was being parted and its organs were being removed. Larson felt his stomach turn against the roast beef sandwich he had for lunch, for lunch uh, but he commanded the sandwich to stay where it was. The hallway turned a corner and Larson hesitated. He waited until the squishy taps moved further away from him. Then he's, he went round the corner. <laughs> the second he looked ahead, he almost turned and ran. Hulking shadows skated across, al along the walls of the hallway in front of him. The shadows, like the rabbit monster, were in perpetual motion. They rose and fell, billowed and contracted. They looked alive, and for all Larson knew, they were. No matter. He had to go on. Larson took another step, and another. Afton's amalgamation crashed through the interior wall of the hallway. Larson attempted to leap forward to clear, to clear the thing's line of sight, but he wasn't fast enough. He had just a second that, if that, to register the appalling composite of um, animatronic body parts and faces that came at him with the speed of a race car and the forces of a battering ram. Did he just see an eye on a kneecap? And was that a kneecap where a shoulder should have been? Had feet been protruding from the thing's neck? And did the feet have mouths? How many mouths had he just seen? Dozens? He didn't have time to answer any of these questions before it was, he was hurled, not in, just into, but through the other hallway wall. Aware of only pain as he flew through the air, he collided with something hard, and then he felt nothing. As soon as the trash monster had integrated the girl endoskeleton, it had turned away and clomped into the factory's interior. It hadn't given Jake even a glance as it passed him. It apparently had enough parts to be satisfied. For a few seconds after the metal man thing had disappeared from Jake's view, Jake considered running away, but he couldn't. The detective was still here, and he was still in danger. Jake had to help, so Jake made himself get up and follow the monster. It wasn't hard to do. It was making a racket. Jake ran toward the sound. Piercing jabs of light stabbed at the blackness that surrounded Larson. He squeezed his eyes shut and moaned. Why couldn't he be left in peace? His head pounded. Touching his forehead, he felt a knot above his light left eyebrow and his fingers came away wet. His chest and his side throbbed too. He was sure he'd cracked a rib or two, maybe more. He felt warm wetness at his side. Maybe he did more than crack a rib. Maybe he broke one and it pierced his skin. Or maybe something sharp had cut him. He was barely aware of lean of he was barely aware of leaning against something jagged and hard. Some kind of equipment. Maybe he'd just he'd been cut on that. Voices whispered at him in the dark, their words capered around the flashes of light in his head. He screwed up his forehead, both to combat the throbbing uh, pain in his skull and to help him focus on what the words meant. He suddenly remembered how he got into this place of darkness and light, of pain and whispering voices, Afton's amalgamation. He stiffened. Where was it? Hurry. That was one of the words he said in his head. Or were the words in his head? Were they outside his head? If they were outside his head, where were they coming from? It sounded like children whispering, or did it? His left ear burned like he'd been slapped hard on the side of his head. His right ear felt like it was filled with cotton. The whispers rose and fell. He could see the words in his mind like ballet dancers spinning and leaping and dipping. Then three words joined together in perfect choreography. Open your eyes, they said. Larson did. Afton was standing over him. So close. Too close. Larson looked into the enormous face hovering above his own. It was a face of nightmares, with eyes made of metal sockets and spark plugs, a mouth formed with... Um, from long pistons and cheekbones composed of large gears and bolts. The face seemed to be held together with bits of pointed metal, rusted pipes and what appeared to be an actual bone, but not the bones one would expect to see in a face. An animatronic elbow acting as a chin was attached with a rat skeleton and a brow made from part of a motor was affixed by a bird's foot.
as repulsive. Oh, bird's foot, blackbird? No, I don't know. Uh, as repulsive as all of this was, though, it wasn't the metal junk that sent chills skittering down Larson's spine. The truly rep repu rep repugnant thing about Afton's new face was that it was in motion. Tucked in and around the metal scrap and bone, animatronic parts wriggled and writhed, and they were singing, or at least that's what it sounded like. Larson could hear a harmonised chorus. Various parts of it seemed to be coming from Afton's spinning ankle joint no nose, shimmying shoulder socket forehead, and tapping metal footed jaws. Each of Afton's ears were made of a different animatronic part. One ear was three quarters of a metal hand and the other ear was a metal jaw. Both the hand and the jaw were moving in time to the music, which seemed to be snippets from the old floor shows that Freddy's animatronics used to do. Thankfully, Larson didn't have time to examine Afton's makeshift face any further because Afton's amalgamation raised a hand that was actually a foot and a hip joint. Larson lunged to his right, but he wasn't fast enough. The sharp metal toes of the foot Afton was using as a hand impaled Larson's belly. Larson cried out when hot pain shot through his gut and radiated across his entire torso, but he was able to jerk free and stagger out of the hideous thing's reach. Grabbing his lower belly, Larson felt warmth flow between his fingers, down over his right hip bone as he busted out of the room he'd been thrown into and ran down the hall to the south exit of the warehouse. Jake watched the detective flee down the hall. He called out, but the detective didn't hear him. Jake was mad at himself. If he hadn't hesitated after the girl endoskeleton attacked him, he could have gotten to the detective in time to prevent what had just happened, but Jake had been weak and selfish. As a result, he'd been too late. The detective would know, of course, that he'd been stabbed, uh, but he th he'd think that that was all that had happened. He would think the injury was bad, but he would but he didn't know that the injury itself wasn't the problem. The problem was that when the trash monster stabbed the detective, it infected him with the spirit of the horrible man who animated him. Jake had known that the evil junk demon was controlled by the awful thing that wanted Andrew, Andrew spirits. Jake had discovered possessed something that was similar to a smell. Each one was distinct. This particular spirit smelled really, really bad, and when it had stabbed the detective, the smell had gone into the detective bo detective's body. Jake was afraid the detective had been infected, and he didn't know how exactly how bad the infection would be. Pretty bad was his guess. For sure, Afton's spirit would fill the detective with evil. But what if it did more than that? What if it killed him? Jake had to get the infection out. The metal monster thundered past Jake, again paying no attention to him. The monster was intent on catching the detective, so Jake chased after it. Behind Larson, Afton's amalgamation howled like a demented hound from hell. Larson could hear its ponderous steps, pursing him as he ran, each footfall sounding like a thunderclap, each thunderclap louder than the last. If Afton had been breathing, Larson would have felt that breath on his neck uh, as he threw the shoulder into the closed door and fell out into the dwindling daylight. He turned and ran north along the side of the factory. He knew where he wanted to go next, but he might or might not take it. Uh, might make it, sorry. He ignored his pain and ran as fast as he could. The second after Larson got where he was going, Afton ripped a hole in the side of the building to pursue the detective. Larson heard the clamorous rending of the metal and Afton's bawling shout. Then he heard the singing he'd heard earlier. It was louder now, almost sing uh, almost frantic as if the cannibalized animatronic parts were trying to comfort themselves with music. Larson imagined the amalgamation's unholy head rotating this way and that, looking for Larson. As Larson did what he needed to do next, he hoped Afton's current form had no supernatural powers other than its ability to animate junk. If Afton was telepathic, Larson was screwed, but he had to try. To Larson's amazement, he was able to get to the forklift without Afton being aware of it. As he climbed onto the driver's seat, Larson hefted the bag of parts he'd been carrying around. He started to tuck the bag onto the floorboard by his feet, but suddenly its contents started moving. For a moment, Larson forgot all about the trash rabbit, because not only was the bag moving, but voices were coming from inside it too. Holding his breath, Larson um, uh, gingerly opened the bag. As soon as the bag opened, the voices got louder. Larson gasped and jerked his head. Uh, his hand back. 
The last thing Larson had put in this bag was a mask. The mask was cracked and muddied, but its features were clear, with rosy red cheeks and purple stripes that stretched from be- from the bottom of its hollow black eyes to the top of its wide open mouth, red lipstick highlighting an amplified pucker. The mask could have been amusing, but it wasn't, especially now, because now the mask had come alive. Its mouth was wide open, and it was wailing something unintelligible. That is definitely the puppet. A hundred percent the puppet, I called it. Larson didn't need to understand its cries, though. Disturbingly, he could hear the mask's intent in his head. It felt like he was receiving the download of a single thought. Take me to him. Not far away, a crash resounded. It spurred Larson into action. Grabbing the bag, Larson hung it on the forklift's prongs. Then he got back into the driver's seat and started up the forklift's engine. The sounds of Afton's amalgamation were getting closer. They were coming from right uh, on the other side of the wall. Larson put the forklift in gear and drove it into the wall, shearing through the metal and impaling Afton in his hip-shaped gut. Yes, Larson, you go. (laughs) The bag containing the mask led the way. When the forklift impacted Afton, Larson saw the bag open. He got a glimpse of black and white stripes. But Larson didn't care about the bag now. He cared about driving Afton into the lake. With one hand on his wound and another on the wheel, Larson kept his foot smashed against the forklift's accelerator. Afton, however, wasn't going into the lake without a fight. He planted his hand slash jaw, slash joint constructed feet, and leaned into the forklift. Larson's forward progress slowed, but it didn't stop. He dug in. Come on, he urged the machine. Come on. The machine gave a great grumble and surged forward. Afton was pushed to the very edge of the dock. Go, 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 Larson muttered, his gaze locked on Afton's soul-freezing eye sockets. Afton was almost at the edge. He was going to. Pieces of the forklift began peeling away and flying through the air toward Afton. First the mast, then the lift cylinder, then the uh, backrest. One after the other, parts of the forklift disconnected from the hull and swept toward Afton's amalgamation. The tilt cylinder, the wheels, the overhead guard, they went in quick succession, followed by the fork's prongs. Everything was being absorbed into Afton's merger of metal, plastic and wire. Larson watched in frightened awe when even the evidence he'd hung on the front of the forklift got slurped into Afton's continually, uh, con- yeah, continually evolving construction. Sorry, he thought he saw one black and white striped arm get siphoned up into Afton's left leg. Then the steering wheel was snatched from his grasp, and he felt the operator's seat gyrate under him. Larson jumped off the forklift and fell to the dock. Holding his gut again, he began crawling backward, away from Afton's mis- uh, evolution. <laughs> um, it continued to consume the forklift. Within seconds, the forklift was nearly gone. Just a few pieces of battered yellow metal remained. The rest was wriggling through Afton's crevices, joining with a jaw here, a gear there. The monster lifted its face to Larson. The detective had nowhere to hide now, and he wouldn't make it far with his injuries. He had one trick left, stalling. Afton? Larson asked. That is you in there, isn't it? Though I'm not sure what to call you now. Afton's amalgamation glared back at the detective, repositioning his pieces so he stood taller and broader on the end of the dock. The loathsome atrocity that was William Afton announced in such sonorous tones that the dock juddered, I am agony. Okay. <laughs> Um, Larson felt his hip, his lip curl. He said nothing, but his mouth dropped open when all the faces and mouths on Afton's trash body began talking at once. Oh my god, that's so creepy. No, not talking. It was the singing again. Larson hadn't had time to examine all of the Afton behemoth when he got up close and personal with Afton's jigsaw puzzle face, so Larson hadn't noticed then whether the totality of Afton's junk had been part of the mutant stage show he'd glimpsed, but now he could see that every animatronic part crammed into Afton's warped configuration was doing its best to sing and dance. All over Afton, animatronic arms and legs, hands and feet, and fingers and toes were swaying and hop and bopping to the music the mouths were attempting to perform. 
Goosebumps erupted on Larson's skin. He covered his ears, then disgusted with himself for letting the uh, creep show unnerve him. He groaned, got up on one knee, and then pushed himself into an upright standing position. He faced Afton. Enough, Larson shouted. The voices stopped. The animatronic part went still. Larson closed his eyes and took a deep breath. He was preparing himself for what he thought might be his final battle. Jake had caught up with the rabbit-shaped trash monster just as the detective had attacked it with a forklift. Not sure how to help at that point, Jake had just hung back and watched as the forklift had driven the monster closer and closer to the lake. When the forklift began coming apart, Jake still wasn't sure what to do. He was thinking hard though. He figured that at the very least, if the trash rabbit got the upper hand, Jake could charge over and pick up the detective. Maybe he could carry the man to safety before the monster could catch them. While Jake was thinking this through, though, something strange happened. The instant the detective closed his eyes, the girl endoskeleton separated herself from the rest of the trash eye, uh, the, from the trash rabbit's parts, undulating past an arm, a leg, and a hip joint. The girl endoskeleton wormed her way to the outer layer of the trash rabbit, and she leaped away from him. As soon as she launched herself free, Jake pressed back into the shadows. He didn't want another encounter with the girl thing. She was scary. Tense enough that he'd been holding his breath if he actually if he actually breathed. Jake watched the girl endoskeleton wriggle across the dock. He kept his gaze riveted on her until he saw her slink toward a gaping vent opening in the side of the factory. Oh god, this is such a good... I like this part. It, 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 so it's the puppet, like... The puppet is, like, self-aware, right? So the puppet is, like, disconnected from Afton's amalgamation. This is weird. This is very weird. When Larson opened his eyes, he expected Afton would still be glaring at him, but Afton wasn't looking at Larson at all. He was staring past La Larson intently, almost pleadingly. Larson turned to see what Afton was looking at, and he saw what appeared to be a female-shaped metal endoskeleton disappearing into a vent opening. It seemed to be the same endoskeleton he'd seen before. Larson frowned. He returned his gaze to Afton, and he saw the plea dissolve into despair. Afton was still a horrifying synthesis of scrap, but he'd taken on an eerily human-looking demeanour. In spite of his size, Afton's mountain of metal seemed to shrink inward, as if becoming weak and frail. Afton's visage... visage? Visage? Afton's visage now looked lost and defeated. Afton's amalgamation dropped its head, and then Afton's expression shifted into what could have been puzzlement. Larson refocused, and he immediately could see what Afton was looking at. Afton was staring at his right side, where the purple-striped mask from the bag was congealed to the animatronic parts. The mask was no longer wailing as it had been when Larson had last seen it. Its white face now looked satisfied, victorious. Larson watched, amazed, as Afton's amalgamation started to pull itself apart. Or at least, that's what appeared to be happening. The destruction started with an arm embedded in the animated junk heap's shoulder. The arm reached out and grabbed a gear-shaped cheekbone, wrenching the cheekbone from the face. The arm moved onto the ear made from a jaw. Another arm came loose from what was the thigh. It reached for the gear that made up a kneecap. It unscrewed it, then flung it into the lake. Now another two arms reached out. One grabbed the piston constructed lips, the other removed an ear-shaped elbow. And more arms began to move. They seemed to spout from every part of Afton's metal jumble like oil gushes shoving through the earth's surface. Every arm that came out grabbed something. One piece after the other was plucked by reaching fingers. It only took a minute before Afton's amalgamation was a roiling lump of body parts and connective pizzas. Um, the unidentifiable fluids began spilling from the deconstructing trash. As they flowed, Afton stumbled backward, one short step from the end of the dock. Larson's legs gave out. He dropped to the deck and sat with both hands pressed to his lower stomach, his eyes wide and staring as blood started pouring from the trash rabbit's mouth. The blood sluis <laughs> The blood was I don't know I can't read that. Sluit Sluist Sluiced Sluiced. Let's go with Sluiced, even though that was not it. Somebody tell me in the comments what that word is. The blood sluiced. No, that's definitely not it. Uh 
over the plastic, metal, bone and wire, and it mixed with the other fluids to flow like hot tar onto the warped planks of the dock. The once identifier through grotesque rabbit was becoming a decomposing trash heap, a frail pile of dis dis disparate by bits, weak and struggling. When the last piece fell into the pyramid of waste, Afton screamed, and the entire tower of worthlessness fell back off the dock. For at least a minute, Larson sat and stared, trying to figure out if he could ever put the words to what had just happened. Then painfully he stood. On unsteady legs, he took short, slow steps toward the edge of the dock. Taking a deep breath, he looked down at the water. He'd been prepared to jump back if he had to, but he didn't have to. What reminded of Afton what sorry, what remained of Afton wasn't a threat. Afton was nothing but a floating stain of insignificant parts bobbing on the surface of the lake. Larson relaxed his muscles, but he covered his nose with his hand. The air was heavy with the smells of acid and decomposition. Oily lather skimmed over the water. Feeling dizzy, Larson leaned against a post at the corner of the dock. He listened to the water fizz and burble, and then he watched the parts begin to sink. A leg, an arm, a foot, gears, joints, mouths. The lake swallowed piece after piece until finally one thing remained. The last piece of Afton's tr trash self was that the lake slipped down its liquid gullet was the purple striped mask of the marionette. Larson crumpled to the dock, and that's when he spotted the stitch wraith again. He could feel blood seeping from its wounds, but he ignored it. The, his vision was becoming blurry. Uh, he had to strain to watch the stitch wraith. As the stitch wraith stepped out of the shadows and onto the dock, Larson tried to push himself back up on his feet. He couldn't let Afton walk away from this factory in any form. Jake knew that a detective thought that Jake was as bad as the trash rabbit. He could feel the detective's anger and fear. But that didn't matter. The detective's infection was already starting to spread. Jake had to stop it. Thankfully, the detective didn't have the strength to get up. Not only did he have, did he lost a lot of blood, uh, but the stinky spirit that had been in the trash rabbit was taking its toll. The detective could do nothing but stare wide-eyed as Jake approached him. Jake knelt by the detective's side. It's okay. I'm not going to hurt you. The detective didn't seem to hear Jake's words. The man's gaze was losing focus and he was terribly pale. Jake looked at the wound in the detective's belly. It was swollen and inflamed and its edges had a sickening greenish tint. How could Jake get the contamination out? Jake looked down at his metal hands. Concentrating, he sent energy from the battery pack he knew powered his endoskeleton. He funneled as much of it charge as he could into one of his hands. And it worked. Jake's metal hand began to glow red with heat. As soon as the glow began to radiate outward, Jake held his hand over the detective's wound. The detective was barely aware of what was happening, but he cried out and tried to writhe away from Jake's hand. Jake used his other hand to hold the detective in place. As soon as the detective was still, Jake lowered his glowing hand. The detective screamed in pain, but Jake, wincing, ignored the sound. He had to burn the infection away, even if it hurt the detective. As soon as the heat met the detective's skin, a greenish gunk that looked like a revolting cross between spoiled cottage cheese and pistachio pudding bubbled up to the surface. Oh god. It immediately began sizzling, which created a nasty reek of putrid, decaying flesh. Jake would have uh, wrinkled his nose if his nose could have wrinkled, but he stayed where he was and he kept his hand in place until the last of the repulsive glob was gone. But by then, the detective had passed out. Jake was happy about that. Jake looked around. What should he do now? The shriek of sirens answered that question. He had to leave. Help was coming, and that help wouldn't see Jake as a good guy. Jake straightened and ran toward the factory. He figured he could wind his way through his its interior and escape out on the other side. As Jake ducked into a narrow hall, though, his footsteps faltered. He'd just had a horrible realisation. Jake forced himself to keep going as he thought about the trash rabbit and the way it had come apart. Jake's own spirit had been close enough to the awful man controlling the trash rabbit, the detective had called him Afton, to know that the awful man's spirit wasn't as powerful as it had pretended to be. Jake had felt that Afton's spirit was barely hanging onto his reality. So how would Afton had been able to battle the detective the way he did? Jake reached the far side of the factory. 
He poked his head out a small door and looked around. Twilight had given way to darkness. The moon was bright enough to light up the area, but the night created enough shadows for Jake to stay out of sight. As he fled the factory, Jake faced the truth that he'd just uncovered. Something besides Afton had been controlling the trash rabbit, and whatever it was, it was worse. Interesting. Uh, I have actually, I, I have absolutely no idea what happened in that story. <laughs> What happened? I didn't understand. The thing I didn't understand was the puppet part. And why did Afton just suddenly, like, collapse? I must have missed that. I miss a lot of things in these stories. I'm very sorry if I missed that. But that was eventful. <laughs> that was eventful. Um, And Jake seems to be right. There must be something besides Afton that is controlling the trash rabbit. Um... So yeah, and, and I really feel like this is leading to security breach. The first thing Larson was aware of when he fought through the cloudy filaments of unconsciousness was the beeping. The next thing he noticed was the smell, an off-putting combination of chicken soup, urine and bleach. Finally, the rest of his senses kicked in. His eyes squeezed shut against an assault of bright light and his body squirmed in reaction to pain in his gut, his ribs, his head, his side, and the back of his hand. He also wasn't happy with the dry, cottony feel of his mouth. He worked his tongue around his teeth as he hesitantly opened his eyes. There you are, a chirpy female voice said. Larson grimaced, but turned toward the sound. A rosy-faced, petite woman in a pink nurse's uniform hovered over him. The nurse was cute, dark-haired and green-eyed. Her name tag read Anita Starling. Larson felt her warm fingers against his skin and she touched the back of his hand near the area that hurt. He groaned as he tried to shift so he could see what was wrong with his hand. Uh-uh, Anita said. Your stomach muscles aren't ready for that kind of thing yet. The source of the hand pain was an IV needle poking beneath his skin. Larson frowned at it. He tried to form a question, but his mouth was too dry. Anita moved away and picked up a small paper cup holding a bendable straw. Here, she lifted the cup near his chin and tucked the straw between his lips. He sucked in water, blessedly wet and cool. Not too much, she warned. You had a nasty infection and you underwent a rather long surgery. Your body isn't ready to guzzle water. Infection? Larson managed. His voice sounded like it had been shredded by a cheese grater. He cleared his throat as he tried to piece together the last thing he could remember. I'll get the doctor in here to explain it to you, Anita said. All I know is that it was a bizarre infection and it was apparently killed by whatever burned your stomach. Burned? Larson asked. He idly wondered how long he'd, been, he'd be speaking in single word questions. Anita adjusted the scratchy blanket that was tucked under Larson's chin. Like I said, I'll get the doctor in here. He can probably tell you more. As it turned out, the doctor wasn't much help. When he visited Larson later that day, he told Larson the infection couldn't be identified. The detective had a hand-sized third-degree burn on his belly. The doctor asked Larson if he knew what had caused it. Larson feigned... feigned? <laughs> feigned ignorance... By the time the doctor had come in, Larson had recovered a hazy memory of the stitch race kneeling next to him, putting a red-hot hand against Larson's stomach. But he wasn't about to try to describe that to the doctor. Once Larson was home and recovering in his apartment, he began champing at the bit to get back to work. The chief had other ideas though. Larson was on leave until he received medical clearance. At least the convalescence, <laughs> the convalescence gave Larson more time to spend with Ryan. His ex-wife was letting the boy visit every day, and the video and board games Larson and Ryan played helped pass the time. Even so, Larson had endless hours at night to think about the events at the factory, and he'd come to a tentative conclusion. The conclusion was strange and surprising, so surprising that Larson was having trouble accepting it. Even so, he was pretty sure his reasoning was sound. He strongly suspected that the stitch wraith wasn't evil after all. After Larson was free of whatever they'd given him for pain at the hospital, his memory of the inexplicable events at the factory became perfectly clear. 
He could see every detail in his mind's eye, and two of them were standing out. Firstly, the stitch rays had appeared to resit, uh, resist sorry, being drawn into Afton's amalgamation. And secondly, the stitch wraith had burned the infection out of Larson's belly. These two details, unless Larson was misinterpreting them, seemed to suggest pretty clearly that the stitch wraith wasn't as bad as Larson had thought it was. If the stitch wraith was Afton, as Larson had thought, why would it have held itself apart from the trash monster? And if it was Afton, why had it removed the infection? Larson intended to find the stitch wraith. He needed to determine exactly what the thing was, whether it was evil or not. That, however, would have to wait. Larson had a more pressing problem to deal with first. It was 2.25am, and Larson was lying in his bed staring at the spidering patterns of light the street lamps threw across his ceiling fan. For at least the tenth time since he'd came home for, from the hospital, he was trying to figure out what was happening to him, because something was wrong, very wrong. Larson's physical wounds were healing well. Each day, the pain from his injuries lessened a bit. But he was experiencing a mental symptom that quite frankly terrified him, so much so that Larson had asked his doctor for a CAT scan to be sure he hadn't suffered a brain injury. When the doctor asked why this was needed, Larson was vague. Weird vision issues, he'd said. The CAT scan didn't uncover anything wrong with Larson's brain. That was both good and potentially bad. The web-like... Oh my gosh, this word. Chiaroscuro. <laughs> the web-like chiaroscuro. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. I'm sorry. Uh, that held Larson's attention was blurry. And Larson was trying to bring it into focus. As always, when he had one of the episodes he was having right then, he felt dizzy and everything around him uh, devolved into a nearly transparent haze. Through that haze... Larson was seeing things he shouldn't have been able to see. He was getting glimpses into the past. These glimpses weren't like daydreams, like the mental pictures that he could summon up when he let his mind wander. These glimpses were real, or at least they seemed real. They were memories, but not his own. These images belonged to others, from different places and different times. Right now, for instance, beyond the shadows on his ceiling, Larson was watching Freddy Fazbear and the other animatronics that had been all the rage when Freddy Fazbear's pizza was in its heyday as they performed a rousing rendition of an 80s rock song Larson hadn't heard in years. The music was so loud and its bass so intense that Larson could feel the beat vibrating his mattress. That was the strange thing about these visions he was having. He wasn't just seeing things from the past, he was experiencing them. In addition to the vibrations that fluttered through his body, Larson could smell fresh pizza, since all he'd eaten earlier was a frozen turkey dinner and some, cop and some popcorn he'd shared with Ryan. He had no explanation for the aromas of tomato sauce and cheese that seemed to waft around him. Um, just saying, this, this sounds very familiar. If you've read the other stories in Gumdrop Angel, this, this entire like concept... Uh, seems It seems very familiar, but I won't spoil that in case you haven't read the other ones. But yeah, it, it's, it's familiar. You'll know what I'm talking about if you've read them. Um, as Larson watched the animatronics perform on a stage that looked like it was filling his bedroom, the scene shifted. This was another thing that was freaky. Not only was he dropping into these lifelike vignettes, but they also changed constantly. One minute he was in Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, the next he was at the movie theatre, the next minute, he was hanging out with his friends, or at least someone else's friends. But always, no matter how many times he jumped from one scene to the next, the filler, that's how he'd come to think of it, between the scenes was always the same. As his mind swept him from one visit to the past to another, he always saw the same thing in between. He saw a ball pit. Oh! Oh! Wait, what? Yo, what? He saw a ball pit? Okay. Okay, what? Oh, I'm so confused. <laughs> oh, what what is the series come to? Um well I'll tell you what it's come to. It started with a ball pit and and now we've come back to a ball pit. What is this? The weird thing about the ball pit was that Larson couldn't remember ever having seen it in real life. Sure, he'd seen a ball pit before, 
Ryan had liked playing in them when he was really little, but Ryan hadn't played in this ball pit. The ball pit that Larson kept seeing was a disgusting ball pit. It was old and the ball's red, blue and green plastic surfaces were faded. They were also woolly, with dust and mildew, as if they hadn't been touched in decades. They smelled, too, not only of that dust and mildew, but of something else, something coppery and decaying. Oh, this, oh my god, I have so many theories going through my brain right now. I might genuinely have to do a video about this. No, genuine. I, ha I have so many thoughts about this right now. Um, about, about how maybe the entirety of Into the Pit could have literally just been a, an, a hallucination. Like, I'm genuinely thinking that right now. I don't know, like, tell me in the comments what you think, but let's hope there's some more about this, because this is very interesting. Uh, also, it wasn't entirely accurate to say that Larson just saw the ball pit. Oh yeah, sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt all the time, but um, the, I swear that was the same description of a ball pit as we heard in Into the Pit as well, so there's a big connection there. Uh, also, it wasn't entirely accurate to say that Larson just saw the ball pit. He actually experienced it, as if he were in it. When the ball pit appeared to him, he could feel the grubby plastic around him, like he was swimming through beads of sphere-shaped water. Except it didn't feel clean like water, in addition to the dusty, mildewy film that made the balls feel scummy. The plastic seemed to have something vis uh, viscous on it, sorry. The spheres tried to adhere to him, like Velcro. Larson blinked when his disneyness abruptly went away and his bedroom came back into focus. This always happened. The visions left him as quickly as they appeared each time. Larson sat up and rubbed his eyes. He rose and shuffled into the kitchen for a drink of water. Standing in front of his sink, he gazed out the small window above it. The night was stormy. All he could see was blackness and rain spotting the panes. He shivered as, the, as he ran water into a glass. Gulping the water, he turned away from the window. Enough, he said out loud. It was time for Larson to get back to work, and the first thing he needed to do was find the ball pit. <laughs> oh yes, he was seeing it for a reason. It had to be related to all the other weirdness he'd experienced. He was going to figure out how it fit into the rest of the puzzle. Oh my god, so he's going to find the ball pit from Into the Pit? Or am I just being completely dumb? So now Into the Pit is in, this, in, in the stitch race. Oh my god, this is amazing. Everything's coming together, boys. <laughs> Pulling his cloak tighter around his doll face, Jake picked his way down a narrow alley. Rain was falling steadily, and even though Jake's doll face eyes weren't real, it still felt weird, uh, weird to have water in them. Jake was happy he had found the cloak he was wearing. It wasn't waterproof. He thought it was made of wool, but it was heavy and it kept most of the water off his face and metal body. It also hid what he was, a little. He still had to keep to the dark back streets, the corners and crevices of the world. Jake had been hiding for nine full sunrises and sunsets since he'd left the factory. During that time, he'd felt sadder than he ever could have, remember being. He missed having Andrew with him in this strange thing he was in, and he felt overwhelmed by the knowledge he carried that something bad was out there. He'd thought about trying to find the bad thing, but what can he do about it if he found it? Besides, he was scared. As Jake passed an open dumpster pressed up against the outer wall of a tall brick building, he heard a scuttling sound. He watched a rat scurry down the side of the dumpster's scarred green metal. When the rat scampered toward the edge of the brick wall, Jake spotted an old, worn hiking boot that moved when the rat ran past it. Jake stopped and peered behind the dumpster. The boot was attached to a man who had long hair and a tangled beard. Jake couldn't tell the man's age. He also couldn't tell whether the man was alive. The man's foot had twitched, but his face was pale and his eyes were closed. Suddenly, the squawk of a siren and the flash of bright headlights invaded the alley. Jake didn't hesitate. He dropped into a squat next to the man. Water sloiced... Why does he keep using this word? Scott, stop using this word. Water went over Jake. Uh, it was overflowing the building's gutters, dropping to the ground in almost solid, wet sheets. The siren screeched again, and a shout rang out. Jake shrank back against the wall. As Jake moved, he lost his balance, and he put out a hand to steady himself. 
his hand landed on the man's shoulder. When it did, the man groaned and moved, exhaling a rank, garlicky breath. Oh no, Jake thought. He immediately felt a wave of suffocating regret. He killed another person. But wait, the man didn't stop breathing. Jake could hear the man's snorting exhales. No black blood ran down his face. He was alive. The siren sound stopped, but Jake could still see the glow of the headlights. Above the patter of the rain, he could hear raised voices. Despite what he could see and hear though, Jake's consciousness was no longer in the alley. He found himself in a cosy, bright dining room. The dining room was dominated by an old oak table, around which sat a happy family. At first, the mom and dad and two children laughing and eating didn't seem at all familiar to Jake. However, as he watched them share pot roast and stories about their days, he realised he was seeing a slightly younger, happier version of the man lying behind the dumpster. Jake didn't know why he was getting a glimpse into the man's past, but he liked it. The scene was so heartwarming, all of the sadness that had weighed on him over the past few days began to disappear, until the scene abruptly changed. Suddenly, the dining room was gone, and Jake was yanked harshly, through what he figured were the man's memories. At eye-boggling super speed, Jake watched the man go to work, come home, play with his kids, have dates with his wife, and go on trips with his whole family. It was like riding a fast train through an amusement park. But then the happy train crashed. It was a real crash, real for the man anyway. Jake's good feelings collapsed into grief as he watched the man crawl from the wreckage of his family van. He wailed in despair as emergency workers pulled his dead family one by one, by one from the crumpled metal. Devastated by what he was seeing, Jake started to remove his metal hand from the man. Jake didn't want to feel what this man felt then, the sharp loss the man still felt now. But Jake also couldn't stand to leave the man caught in this web of misery. What if Jake could do something to help? Jake concentrated, and he sent his thoughts back through the soup of memories he'd just seen. Maybe he could pull one out, a good one, and make it be uh, bigger and brighter than the rest. If he could, he could ease the man's pain. He had to try. Jake knew exactly which memory to make the biggest. It was the first one, the happy family dinner. Jake put all his focus on that memory. He, pu he pushed his intention into it, so it puffed up in his mind. It was almost like blowing up a balloon, only the balloon was a memory, and the air was Jake's will. Jake made the memory bigger and bigger, and then he gently suggested uh, it back to the man's unconscious mind. In a way, he put the man's mind inside the bubble of that one happy scene. And then Jake let go of the man. As soon as he did, he was back in the alley. The rain was coming down harder now, and the voices Jake had heard before were coming closer. Jake had to get out of there. First though, he looked down at the man to make sure he was okay, and Jake was happy to see that the man's face was no longer contorted with pain. In fact, the man looked like he might have been smiling, and his breathing was softer, more even. A clatter and the sound of footsteps spurred Jake into action. He leaned forward and looked around the corner of the dumpster. Two men were making their way down the alley toward where Jake hid. They'd find him if he didn't do something. Jake looked around. There was no way he'd be able to run off without being seen, but behind him a small door led into the brick building whose gutter was spilling water over the dumpster. Jake quickly grasped the doorknob and wrenched it. The door gave way and he slipped into the darkness inside. Closing the door behind him, Jake stood next to it for several seconds, listening. The rain could still be heard in there, but otherwise the place was silent. Pressing his hands against the door, to keep it closed, he waited to see if the men would try to open it. After several minutes, he relaxed. They must have moved on. Jake turned and surveyed his surroundings. A weak glow from a sputtering streetlight came through a dirty window a few feet from the door. It was enough to reveal stacks of boxes and crates. He was in some kind of storage room. Jake moved further into the room and lowered his endoskeleton into a crate. He threw back the hood of his cloak and thought about what had just happened. What he'd been able to do was pretty cool, but how did he do it? He didn't know, but just thinking about how he'd been able to help that man, even if just for that night, made him a little less sad. Maybe he could do more than just lurk in the dark. 
Maybe he could do something good. As soon as Jake had this thought, he heard a muffled scrape. Yeah, scrape, sorry. Uh, that doesn't look like a word. Scrape, <laughs> sorry. Um, standing, he looked around again. He still saw only boxes and crates. But when he heard a faint snore, he started looking behind the stacks. Just past the third stack he explored, Jake found a tall, skinny teenage girl, wearing just a thin grey t-shirt and ripped jeans. The girl was curled on her side, asleep. She looked cold, so Jake took off his cloak and bent down to cover her. When he crouched next to her, he realised that she was more passed out than asleep. Her face was slack, and the circles under her eyes were so dark they looked like smudges of charcoal. Jake tucked his cloak around the girl, and as he did, a scene from an old TV commercial flashed through his mind. It was one of the anti-drug commercials that stamped the slogan, Just Say No, across scenes of pale, passed-out, skinny teens. This girl looked like one of those, uh, one of the ones in the commercial. Jake frowned as he gazed at the girl. He knew how destructive drugs could be. Drugs killed people. This poor girl was in trouble. She obviously needed help. Maybe Jake could do something for her. Studying the girl in the muted light, he saw that if she hadn't been so pale and thin, she might have been pretty. She had long, reddish-brown hair that was thick and wavy. It was dirty and tangled now, but he thought it could look nice if it were washed and brushed. He couldn't see the girl's eyes, but her features were nice. As he looked at her face, though, he noticed that her lips were dry and cracked. She needed water. Looking around once again, Jake managed to find a discarded plastic container. He took the container to the door, opened the door a couple inches to check, in, uh, to check outside, and when he didn't see anyone, he stepped out and held the container under the heavy rain. It only took a few seconds to fill the container, and once that was done, Jake ducked back inside the room. He hurried over to see if, the girl, if he could get the girl to swallow the water. The girl moaned when Jake nudged her lips with the container. He frowned, not sure what to do next. Before he could figure it out, the door behind him swung open, the wind blowing rain into the room. It blew in something else too. Two men swept through the open door. One of them slammed it closed. Although Jake wasn't at all hidden from the men, the room was so dim that he was pretty sure they didn't see what he had what he was at first, or if they did, they didn't seem to care. What are you doing in here? One of the men growled. This man was the smaller of the two, but that wasn't saying much. Both men were tall and broad-shouldered. Jake could tell that neither man was a nice man. One of them was scowling, and the other had features that were settled into what was probably a permanent sneer. They both had dark, mean eyes. Are you deaf? The second man asked. He asked you a question. The second man, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, the second man whose face was covered with old scars stomped over and kicked at Jake. Jake didn't react, but the movement and the sound woke up the girl. She opened her eyes. They were a deep blue, and immediately she hugged herself, curling up tighter as if she could wrap herself, uh, wrap her body in a cocoon of safety. She was clearly afraid of the scar-faced man. When the girl's gaze flitted to the second man and she tried to scoot backward, Jake could see that she knew both of them. Jake shifted his attention back to the men. Jake was pretty sure they were dealers. The two men started approaching. Jake decided he needed to make them go away. He stood up. Now that Jake was upright, the men couldn't fail to see Jake's metal endoskeleton. It didn't seem to faze them though. Both men gave Jake a nonchalant once over. What are you supposed to be? The scar-faced man asked. The other man laughed. Get lost on your way to a costume party? When Jake didn't respond, Scarface charged toward him. Get out of the way, punk! He pointed at the girl. She owes me money! Jake didn't move. He wasn't going to let these men bully the poor girl. He crossed his arms because he thought it would make him look tougher. The men sidestepped Jake as if he were nothing. As Jake turned, Scarface strode to the girl and kicked her leg. Where's my money, you piece of trash? <laughs> hey, Jake shouted, leave her alone. Both men laughed, and Scarface pulled out a knife. Before he could do anything with it, though, Jake took a quick step forward. He didn't think, he just acted. His anger and outrage were driving him. 
Jay grabbed the scowling man and lifted him easily, dangling the man in front of him. Jake shook him hard. The man immediately went from the sarcastic jerk to a snivelling, uh, yeah, snivelling kid. He started crying. Please, please, the big man begged. I didn't mean... Jake didn't bother to listen to whatever the man was going to say. He was too angry to hear clearly anyway. It felt like an ocean was roaring in his head. He could feel heat pulsing through his endoskeleton. Jake gave the man another violent shake. Then he tossed him through the window. Glass shattered and sprayed. Rain splattered uh, in through the, the hole the man's body had made. Jake turned toward the other man. The man with the scar held up his hands and cowered away from Jake. Hey, it's just business. He was whining like a kid too. Jake didn't care. He stepped forward and backhanded the man across the jaw. The man went flying into a stack of boxes. He rolled onto the ground and Jake sh uh, dropped down on top of him. Jake's rage burned even hotter. And when he pointed a finger at the man's face, his finger was glowing red hot. Jake studied the man's cruel eyes. Easily holding the struggling man down, Jake thought for a few seconds. He bent over and held the tip of his metal finger against the man's forehead. A few minutes later, Jake stepped out of the alleyway and looked up and down the main street. The girl, cradled in his arms, had passed out again. She felt nearly weightless to Jake. Jake shifted his cloak so it covered her face. Then he strode down the street, searching for a safe place where he could take care of her. After two days of rain, the sun had come out and everything still damp from the storm, seemed to glitter in the brightness. Or maybe that was just Larson's mood. He was feeling good. Well, maybe not good, but better. He spent most of the morning tracking down buildings that might contain the ball pit that kept sucking him away from the real world. The threads he pulled were at... were The threads he pulled at were serpentine, and they... Oh my god, I'm so confused on what this sentence is. The threads he pulled at were serpentine, and they resulted in a list of dozen possible locations there, sorry. Uh, over the next couple hours, Larson visited more decrepit, boarded up arcades than he'd cared to see, but eventually his search led him to the derelict place he stood in front of now. A tired looking man gave Larson the key to what appeared to be an old restaurant. Then the old guy shuffled off as if he didn't care at all what Larson might do to the place. Larson could see why. Ah, oh, is it, is it, uh, is it, uh, Jeff? Is it Jeff? What was the, what was the guy's name in, in Into the Pit? Was it Jeff's? Jeff's Pizza? I think it was Jeff. <laughs> this is giving me serious, like, recall, uh, issues. I don't know. Um, Larson could see why. The cavernous dining room he stood in held nothing but cracked vinyl boots and scarred tables. The tables were lined up on a black and white checkerboard floor and the boots hugged pale yellow walls that held that had vague shapes attempting to peek through the walls. Bad paint job! Uh, yeah, I swear this is Jeff's Pizza or whatever it's called. It has to be. Uh, in addition to the tables and booths, the room held an empty stage and a bare dance floor that looked forlorn under a smudged, broken mirror ball. The room was thick with dust. Whole civilizations of dust bunnies wafted when Larson moved. The air in the place smelled musty. It was also vaguely sour, like the inside of a refrigerator filled with spoiled food. Larson put the back of his hand to his nose. As soon as Larson had entered the place, he spotted what he was looking for. The ball pit was in the back right corner of the room. Cordoned off by a dingy yellow rope, the ball pit warned away potential visitors with a sign that read, Do not use. Who would try? Larson muttered as he walked toward the place that had commandeered his consciousness so many times in the past few days. It wasn't a figment of his imagination. It actually existed, and it clearly wanted him to find it, which was disturbing in the extreme. Larson glanced over his shoulder and gave himself a mental shake. He was a cop, for Pete's sake. He wasn't scared of a stupid bull pit, was he? Larson crossed over to the limp, dirty yellow rope. He lifted it, ducked beneath it, and stepped up to the edge of the bull pit. He studied the plastic bulls. They looked exactly the same as they did in his visions. They were dusty, mildewy, and faded. He reached out and picked one up. It was just as he knew it would be rough and somehow sticky. 
like it wanted to cling to his skin. He frowned and scraped a fingernail over the sphere's surface. Something flaky, almost charred-looking, coated the plastic. Larson wanted to drop the filthy ball. But Larson wasn't there to be grossed out. He was there to investigate. So he didn't drop the ball. Instead, he held it up in front of his gaze and examined it closely. He frowned. The substance covering the plastic surface looked like blood. Old, old blood. Larson took out his penknife and dug an evidence bag from his pocket. He took scrapings off the ball. Then he examined a few more plastic balls. All had the same substance on their surfaces. Larson took multiple sa uh, samples. When he was done, he stepped back and stared at the creepy pit. Finally, he shook off the heebie-jeebies that gripped him and left the abandoned restaurant. Interesting. The young doctor was wiped out, which was normal. She was on the tail end of a triple shift, and the stream of patients coming through the ER never ended. Brushing hair from her face, the doctor pushed through the door to exam room four fifths, or four out of five. I don't, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> uh, four five, I guess. Uh, the room had two beds separated by a curtain. She shoved the curtain back and looked at the two patients in the side-by-side -side beds. Both patients were men. Both looked like drug dealers. She'd seen their, t their kind too many times to count. The bigger man had come into the ER screaming, but after the doctor had determined he had a broken collarbone, she'd ordered a morphine drip. That man was now drifting in La La Land. The second man wasn't as badly injured, but his forehead appeared to be burned. The doctor pulled the treatment tray up to the man's side. She reached for some uh, gauze or gauze. Uh, let's get this cleaned up and see what needs to be done, she said. He didn't respond, he just moaned. The doctor blotted at the man's forehead for a few seconds, then she stopped. She sucked in her breath. Now that she'd cleaned up the area, she could see that someone had burned the words just say no into the man's forehead. <laughs> oh, 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 that's good. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. That's great. Uh, near the railroad tracks along the edge of town, a small maintenance shed squatted well away from anything else in the area. It was padlocked when Jake found it, but he'd easily removed the lock. Now Jake and the girl were safely tucked inside the small building. The girl was still asleep. Jake was watching her carefully. Jake found the shed right before dawn. After he put the girl inside, he went back out and quickly foraged for something to make her more comfortable. He found some blankets in a nearby dumpster and he came back to layer the dreist of them over her frail form. Soon after night gobbled up dusk, the rain, which had left the area that morning, returned. A steady drumming now pounded on the tin roof above Jake's head. It sounded like a troop of gnomes tap dancing to music Jake couldn't hear. The clamour didn't seem to bother the girl. She occasionally murmured in her sleep, and sometimes she kicked out, as if fending off an unseen assailant. But mostly she was quiet and still. Jake sat next to her, watching over her. He also watched the door. Although he'd secured it with some rope he'd found in the shed, he was on alert. He didn't know who else might be after the girl, or when they might come looking for her. For the first couple hours after nightfall, all was quiet except for the gnome dancing. However, when the rain let up enough for Jake to hear an owl hoot nearby, he heard something else. Something that had him standing, poised to fight. Outside the shed, something scraped across the wood siding. After the scrape, a metallic rattle cascaded down the door, then seemed to scrabble up the wall next to it. Then something thumped on the roof and clicked down the other side of the shed. Jake traced, uh, Jake traced sorry, the movement carefully. Something was out there. Something was crawling out there. He was sure of it. Jake pulled his metal legs close to his body and edged nearer to the girl. He knew he was currently occupying a big endoskeleton, but right this second, he didn't feel like that. He felt like the kid he really was. Something was outside the shed, scrabbling around as if it was trying to find a way in. Jake cocked his head, listening. He put an arm protectively over the girl, just in case whatever was out there broke through the roof. But he also trembled. He wished someone was there to put an arm over him too. <laughs> oh, Jake. Oh my God. Oh, I love Jake so much.
Oh, Jake is such a like an adorable character, a really wholesome character. I'm glad that the Stitch race is um is is being like really positive now, and 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 even like Larson is is saying like, oh yeah, maybe the Stitch race might be good. Um, hopefully this all means that they're going to um like attack uh <laughs> the bad forces uh together. Um, I, I have no idea what I'm talking about there, but what is the, what is the thing that is crawling? Like, um, huh, I don't know. Uh, crawling. Are there any details? Something thumped on the roof and clicked down the side of the shed. A scrape, a metallic rattle. I have a feeling it's like mangle or something. You know, my, oh! Oh, could it? Oh, it just hit me. It just could it be um, what's his name? Julius. Julius. Could it be Julius from um? Oh God, I can't even remember what that that one was called. The breaking reel. The breaking wheel. Sorry. It could be Julius, because we don't know how that fits into the stitch wraith yet. So, it could be from that story. Either way, this actually might have been one of my favorite stitch wraith stories so far, um, or one of my favorite parts so far. It was so. It was really wholesome. We got a little bit of like law and and the ball pit. Oh my god! I'm gonna need to do some thinking once I have ended this video, because that is that is amazing. <laughs> I did not see that coming uh, with the ball pit uh, and the hallucinations and things like that. Larson was bent over his desk writing up a report on a manslaughter he and Roberts had cleared that morning. Roberts wasn't helping at all. He was berating Powell for bringing a Limburger cheese and liverwurst sandwich for lunch. Larson had to admit the smell was pretty bad, but Roberts wasn't being paid to be the scent police. Larson was nearly done, even without Roberts' help. He was filling in the last section when a folder landed on his desk with an audible slap. Her jaw were waiting for the, these res yeah, her jaw were waiting for these here results. It's about the uh, the DNA, I, I, I guess. Uh, the heavy drool lifted Larson's gaze. One of the new detectives, Chansey, Larson wasn't sure if this was the first or last name, stood next to Larson's desk. He was tapping one of his cowboy boot clad feet on the scuffed floor. Chansey was an angular guy with a jutting jaw and bony shoulders, dirty blonde hair that hung over his eyes, and a grin that looked even less genuine than his drool sanded. Chansey had joined the squad while Larson was in the hospital. Larson had heard the guy was just supposed to be a fill-in for Larson while he was gone, but for some reason Chansey was still here. This something I could get in on? Chansey said. Looks hinky to me. Is it a cold case? Larson flipped open the folder and scanned to the top page. He shook his head. It's just something I was following up on. I'll let you know if I need your help. He gave Chansey a fake friendly smile and pushed the folder aside as if it was nothing. Chansey shrugged and wandered away from the bullpen. Larson opened the folder and studied its contents. He started frowning as soon as he began reading. What in the world was going on here? Larson had sent 30 samples to the lab. He'd expected to be told they were blood samples and he'd expected them to be 30 different blood samples. He was only half right. The samples were blood, but they weren't different. Well, they were different, but they weren't from different individuals. The blood samples, according to his report, were from the same person, but they were all from different time periods. What? This meant someone, the same someone, or the same something, had bled in that pit every year for decades. Wow. Larson picked up the phone and punched in a number. After a ring, a woman answered in a sing-songy voice. Lab, Tabitha here. Hey Tabby, I'm looking at the report you sent over. He tapped the pages in front of him. Are you telling me that something has been coming in and out of that ball pit for over three decades, and it's been bleeding? It's weird, for sure, Tabby said. But yeah, the blood is from the same person. But each sample has degraded differently, indicating a different year for each one. You're onto something funky, Larson. That's one word for it. Thanks, Tabby. Larson hung up the phone and leaned back. Something bigger was going on here, bigger even than having baffling glimpses into the past. He needed to find out more about the building where he'd found the pit. Maybe solving this mystery would lead him back to the stitch wraith. 
Strangeness seemed to radiate outward from the freakish thing. Whether the Stitch Wraith was evil or not, Larson wanted to find it and get to the bottom of whatever the heck was going on. Jake pushed through the shed's doorway. He carried a lumpy bundle wrapped in the folds of his cloak. Although the previous night's rain has stopped, the sky was still heavy with grey clouds. The sun was trying to break through them, but so far it wasn't having any success. Very little light made its way through the doorway into a small space when Jake stepped inside. Even in the murk though, Jake could see that the girl was no longer curled up on the floor. She was sitting up. Jake closed the door and slowly approached the girl. He tried to hunch a little so his size wouldn't intimidate her. But he shouldn't have bothered. The girl looked up at him with no fear at all. Hi, the girl said in a sweet, scratchy voice. She'd said hi as if she were talking to a normal kid. So Jake responded as if he was. Hi, I'm Jake. What's your name? Jake, the girl said. That's a nice name. I'm Ronell. That's a nice name too, Jake said. Very pretty. As he spoke though, Jake felt funny about the girl's name. It sounded wrong to him, like it didn't fit her or something. But that was silly. Thanks, the girl said. Jake watched her and mentally repeated her name. Something sounded off about it, like it was a half-truth. The girl smiled at Jake. Jake stopped worrying about her name. He squatted down next to her and dumped the canned goods he'd foraged onto the floor next to her. She immediately reached out, grabbed a tin of tuna and, rugged, and tugged on its pull tab. I'm starving, Ronell said as she scooped tuna from the can with her fingers. Jake couldn't stop smiling. She looked so much better. Colour was back in her cheeks. Her eyes were bright and animated. Ronell had obviously finger combed her hair and straightened her clothing while Jake was gone. Her face was cleaner, so she must have spit scrubbed it. Weirdly, it looked like Ronell wasn't as skinny as she'd been when Jake had left her, but that was obviously impossible. Uh oh, it's a different child. Jake figured that Ronell's renewed energy made her look more substantial than she had when she was passed out. While Ronell ate, she looked around. Where are we? she asked with her mouth full. When she realised what she'd done, she giggled and covered her mouth with her hand. Sorry. Jake laughed. It's okay. He looked around the shed. We're near the railroad tracks. I wanted to get you some place no one comes to, away from those men. Ronell's pretty blue eyes widened. What men? The two men who looked like they wanted to hurt you, he hesitated. Should he tell her what he thought? He decided he should. He wanted them to be friends and he was always honest with his friends. I think they were your dealers. Ronell had finished the tuna and she was waiting for a can of peaches. She stopped and sucked in her breath. Her gaze darted toward the door. Where are they now? Don't worry, I took care of them. They're not going to find you here. Ronell returned her gaze to Jake. She shivered once, but then nodded. Thanks. She popped open the peaches and began slurping peach juice. Jake was amazed that Ronell didn't seem bothered by his appearance. She was treating him like an ordinary boy. You're not afraid of me, Jake. Wait, oh, sorry, you're not afraid of me, Jake blurted. You helped me, and besides, Ronell ate a peach slice and looked Jake up and down. After she swallowed, she said, I've been on the street long enough to know that w what we think of as monsters, things that might look like you, aren't the real monsters. Mo most real monsters are people, especially guys who think they can push around girls like me just because I don't have a place to live. But you? You're not a monster. You just look different. I'm glad you think that, Jake said. He reached, he watched her eat. He wanted to ask her questions, but he wasn't sure if it was polite. Ronell finished the preachers and licked her fingers. She looked at Jake. You're wondering why I'm a druggie? Jake shook his head, but she was right. He did wonder. Ronell crossed her legs and hugged herself. My mum died when I was 13. Jake sat down next to Ronell. He thought about touching her hand, but he wasn't sure he should. I'm sorry, he said. I know what that's like. My mum died too. It's awful. Oh my god. Jake! <laughs> Ronell touched Jake's cloak. I'm sorry too. Yeah, it is. Her gaze drifted off past gay sho uh, Jake's shoulder. That was just two years ago, but it feels like forever. I was really close to my mum, and when she died, I was a mess and no one was there for me. What about your dad? Jake asked. Ronell shook her head. He was all wrapped up in his own grief, and he couldn't deal, you know? He disappeared into his work, got obsessive about it. He couldn't help me. She sighed. I tried to cope. I really did, but 
I finally couldn't stand the pain anymore. Rennell smiled at him. You're really nice. My dad didn't understand at all. He hauled me off to one of those schools for kids who get in trouble and he left me there. When I got out, uh, he was still wrapped up in his work. I stole some of his money and when he found out I'd done that, he kicked me out. Told me not to come back. I'm so sorry. Rennell shrugged and reached for another can. This one, a small tin of deviled ham. Deviled? De deviled. <laughs> deviled ham. She opened it and scooped out some of the salty smelling pink meat. She chewed, swallowed and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. Rennell concentrated on eating, but her eyes were shiny with tears. Jake could tell she loved her dad and missed him. He could intensely feel her loss. Watching Rennell polish off the deviled ham, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jake decided he was going to find Rennell's father and get them reunited. He doesn't know how, but he was going to figure it out. The moment Jake made his decision, the sun won its battle with the clouds. A ray of golden light shot in through the shed smudged window and landed on Rennell. The light made Rennell look like a sweet angel, and it revealed something Jake hadn't noticed before. Rennell was wearing a very unusual pendant. Oh no. Hanging from a silver chain, the pendant was a somewhat misshapen silver heart. The puffy shape reminded Jake of things he'd seen in comic strips. This heart was the kind of heart he'd expected cartoon character to wear. It's not the same one um, that Eleanor gave Sarah, right? It, right? <laughs> oh no. No. The, the way the sun hit the silver made it glint and flash sparkles. The sparkles made Jake smile. He thought it was a sign that something good was going to happen. Are you kidding me? That's it? Oh. Ah, oh, nothing. Ah, oh, what? Are you kidding me? There was like nothing there. Ah, oh. boo. <laughs> no, uh, that was that was okay. That was, it was. I th I feel like it was more of a filler kind of part, but I I can't wait for the finale of this. Um, there's only two more. There's only two more of these until the finale. But that that must be the necklace, right? The pendant, huh? That's... Ah! Oh, oh! I, d I don't know how this is going to end. I don't have a clue. Larson leaned over his desk, frowning at his computer screen. He hated following paper trails, or more accurately, electronic trails. All the forms being trapped behind his desk for days at a time. It was his least favourite part of police work. He preferred being out in the field, talking to witnesses, and chasing down suspects, for, but for all his annoyance, this kind of investigating was important too. For days now, he'd been trying to trace the history of the building where he'd found the ball pit, but he'd landed in a quagmire of real estate transactions and business permits. The building had been the home of so many failed ventures that trying to follow the transfers was making Larson's eyes burn. This wasn't his forte. Larson sat back and rubbed his itchy eyes. The addresses and phone numbers were all blurring together. Opening his eyes, his gaze landed on Chansey, who was strolling toward the coffee machine. Larson wasn't crazy about Chansey, but Chansey was the only other detective in the bullpen right now. Roberts and Powell were both testifying in court this afternoon, and the other detectives were out for a coffee break. At least the absence of Roberts and Powell meant the bullet pen, or the bullet pen? The bullpen smelled better than usual. The only odour Larson noticed came from the bitter dregs in the coffee maker. Hey Chansey, Larson called out. Chansey turned, grinned, and sauntered back toward La Larson. What's up? he asked. Larson waved him over. He pointed out his computer screen. You only good at tracing ownership of real estate. I found a trail so convoluted I cannot make heads nor tails of it. Chansey pulled up a chair next to Larson's desk. The chair legs scraped across the floor. Larson got a whiff of spicy cologne. Sure thing, Chansey said. That's as easy as apple pie. Larson raised an eyebrow. Um, okay. He pointed at his screen again. What do you make of this? Chansey scanned the screen, then reached for Larson's keyboard. Mind? Larson waved his okay. Chansey took over the keyboard and typed at a, blasting, uh, a blast, blazing fast speed for several minutes. 
More addresses and phone numbers flashed across the screen. Larson felt a headache coming on. Finally, Chansey leaned back. He shook his head. This place has had more names and owners than a stray dog has fleas. Larson frowned. But who owns it now? Chansey gestured at the screen. Well, there, that's... Well, that there's where we get thrown off the bull. I can't figure that out from just a quick dive. Larson studied Chansey. The cowboy persona was annoying, but the man wasn't stupid. Think you could, uh, you didn't think you could if you spend some time on it? I'd sure give it my best shot, Chansey said. Larson handed Chansey part of the bull pit file. He kept back the lab results and added those to a stack of files he'd pulled a couple of hours before. Go for it, Larson said. Chansey took the file and grinned. Then he moseyed away to get the coffee he'd seen he'd been after in the first place. Larson looked around to make sure no one had come to, into the bullpen to see what he was working on. He was still alone. Taking out a yellow legal pad, he opened the lab report and the top file in the stack he'd created, then got to work. It took Larson an hour to finish his lists. By this time, a couple of detectives were back, but they weren't paying Larson any attention. Larson put down his pen and studied the pages in front of him. Earlier that morning, he had started cross-checking the dates associated with the blood samples uh, against dates of other crimes. He was hoping to link the blood samples to unsolved murders. That didn't happen, but he had linked them to something. It turned out that the blood sample dates coincided with bizarre incidents, ranging from missing persons to almost every other kind of strange phenomena imaginable. In more than one incident, parents reported that their teens had found a strange robot-like body, like a metal mannequin, not long before the teens disappeared. Larson skimmed all these statements. At first he was tempted, like the detectives who had taken the statements, to dismiss the reports as the confused ramblings of freaked out parents. But the details the parents gave were too similar. The body looked female, with a pale, gaunt face decorated with crude clown makeup. Is this Eleanor? Is this Eleanor? I don't know. It, 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 I might be getting the wrong end of the stick. Or it could be the puppet? No, 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 no. I don't know. Now that Larson had made his lists, he could see that a teenager had gone missing during several, time, uh, several of the time periods associated with the blood samples Larson had taken. Not every teen was associated with the metal mannequin, but every teen's disappearance did happen on a date listed on the bull pit blood sample list. What did that mean? The blood couldn't belong to the teens, because it was the same blood each time. Who did it belong to? Larson pushed aside his lists and started flipping through the files again. He went through photo after photo of happy or sullen-faced teens. They didn't reveal anything that he... Wait a second. Larson went back to a photo he just turned over. He dug in his drawer for a magnifying glass. Holding the glass over the photo, he looked past the shoulder of one of the missing girls, and there it was behind her. The metal mannequin with the clown face. It was real. And now, Larson knew what it looked like. Larson examined the metal mannequin carefully. Its face was skeletal, as though the thinnest layer of deceased grey skin had been stretched over its skull. The skin was painted ga garishly with a candy apple red mouth and pink circles on the cheeks, giving it the hideous clown-like appearance some of the parents had mentioned. Its large, deep-set eyes were dark pits, and its red painted mouth was stretched wide, revealing a mouthful of large, jagged teeth. So it's Eleanor, right? I, I think it's Eleanor. Uh, Larson couldn't tell if it was smiling or baring its teeth in aggression. The thing's sparse red hair was pulled into, tw into twin pigtails on top of its head, a bizarrely childish hairstyle for something so hideous. The whole thing gave Larson the creeps. So did the weird cartoonish heart pendant hanging around its neck. There we go. He wasn't sure why the heart gave him the heebie-jeebies, but it did. So hang on a second. Let's just pause there. Because that's useful information. So not only... W in To Be Beautiful, we see one of these incidents, right? Of the girl turning into metal and then Eleanor running away with Sarah's body. We see that incident happen, Okay. But that's only one of the incidents. There have been so many incidents with this clown girl in common, and it's been over 
the course of 30 years? Huh. Am I right in saying that? I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm right in saying what I'm saying, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Larson quickly went back through the files again, noticing something he'd missed before. He flipped back and forth through the reports. Finally, he picked up his pen and jotted a note on the bottom of his lists. Now he had something else too, a name. Although most of the incidents were seemingly unrelated from a glance, someone must have investigated their connection at one point, because an expert of some sort had been called in on more than one occasion. A Dr. Talbert! Wait, what story is Talbert from? Isn't that... Is, not, is that not from... Um, is that not from... Uh, the story that we literally just read, Together Forever? I'm sorry I have to do this, but... Talbert. Let's search. Uh, no. Where's Talbert from? I have to find out now. Okay. Let me just... I am really sorry that I have to pause here, but we have to go through this slowly. Because there is a lot to take in here. So, uh, Fazbeth writes... Dr. Talbert. I swear he's from a story. Is he from the... Epilogues? Just the epilogues? Uh... Uh... No, I, I, I don't think we've seen Talbot. Ha, huh, that's weird. It seems like a, a, a name. Like I... like... A name that I should recognise. Anyway. He apparently specialised in a mysterious material called... <gasps> called Remnant! What?! Oh my god! Oh my god, okay, okay, this is crazy. Remnant, according to the investigator who's seen it, looks like bubbling liquid mercury. We know what Remnant is, but no one knew what it did. No one had been able to get their hands on a sample of it, so it had never been analysed. Remnant is a bubbling liquid mercury? Okay, okay, that's, that's cool. I love that, that's very cool. How did all this fit together? And what did it have to do with the Stitch Wraith? Larson didn't know. The ball pit might have been visiting him in his visions, but it didn't seem to be leading him to any answers, or at least not any answers that made sense. Larson's only choice was to locate the Stitch Wraith. The Stitch Wraith was at the heart of everything, no pun intended. Maybe Larson would get his answers when he found it. Okay, this is interesting. It had taken Jake several days, but he'd finally done it, or at least he thought so. He was pretty sure he'd found Rennell's father. While he nursed Rennell back to health, Jake had coaxed as much detail from her as he could about her father and where she'd lived. It had been tricky because he didn't want her to know what he was doing. He was pretty sure she'd resist any idea of going home. She clearly missed her dad, but she tensed up every time Jake mentioned him. For those of you who don't know, Rennell backwards is Eleanor, so we assume that this is Eleanor. Um, anyway... Jake had tried to get the information by touching Rennell, hoping to see her memories like he had seen those of the man behind the dumpster. Unfortunately, probably because of her history with drugs, Rennell's memories were disjointed and unclear. They seemed as off-base to him as Rennell's name still felt. He continued to sense that Rennell had another name, but he hadn't asked her about it. All in all, nothing that Jake had gotten from Rennell had given him clu any clues about where her dad lived. And because Rennell's memories were jumbled, Jake hadn't been able to use them to soothe her. He hadn't been able to pick a nice one and make a bubble from it like he had for the homeless man. Even so, Rennell was much better. The food Jake had managed to get for her had worked magic. You're quiet tonight, Rennell said. It was late evening. The sun had been down for just an hour or so. The night outside the shed's window was clear. A nearly full moon cast a gleaming beam of pale yellow light into the shed. Rennell had just finished a can of fruit cocktail and was braiding her hair into pigtails. Even though she hadn't been able to wash it, it still looked pretty to Jake. I have something to tell you, Jake said, but I'm not sure if you're going to be happy with me. Rennell laughed. You've been nicer to me than anyone else since my mum died. Why wouldn't I be happy with you? Jake decided it was time. I want to take you home, he said. He braced himself for her reaction. Rennell tizzled her head and studied Jake. Her expression didn't change. She just shrugged and said, Okay. 
Well, that was easier than he thought it would be. Oh, Jake said. Winnell laughed again, but blinked, as if holding back tears. When? For a second, Jake was flustered, but then he understood. How about now? Ronell nodded, stood, and took his metal hand. Jake pushed the door open, and together they left the shed and headed toward the railroad tracks. Ronell's home was on the outskirts of town, and the tracks led to the street her dad lived on. It didn't take Jake and Ronell long to walk from the shed to the right street. Ronell had more strength in her legs than Jake expected. They were walking through an area that was more rural than urban. Its houses were mostly single-storey and sprawling. Jake thought the style of homes here was called contemporary. He decided it wasn't something he liked. Somehow the homes didn't look very inviting. They weren't cosy and warm like the small house he'd grown up in. When they, left, when they first left the tracks, Ronell had followed Jake as if she didn't know where they were going. But now Ronell's steps were growing surer. Jake wondered why he'd worked so hard to figure out where her dad was. He could have just asked Ronell where she lived. She seemed to have no resistance to returning home, at least not until they reached the house. Ronell's dad lived in a white house that looked like a collection of child's building blocks. It was even more harsh looking than the other modern houses in the area. The various chunks of the house had big windows, all covered with shades. Light filtered through the shades, illuminating a mostly concrete and rockyard front. Uninviting, Jake thought. When Ronell's footsteps faltered on the home's front porch, Jake took her hand. It's okay, I'll make sure he's not mean to you. Ronell looked up at Jake, she smiled. He rang the doorbell. As soon as the doorbell chimed, the, door, the front door unlatched and swung open. Well, that was weird, Jake thought. Put it in a foyer, a deep male voice called out. I'll be right there. Jake looked at Ronell. She seemed to have gotten her nerve back. She stepped into the house as she stared. Dad must get a lot of deliveries. Jake followed Ronell through the door, and he stopped as soon as he was inside. The house was more welcoming on the inside. The sofa in the living room was a soothing soft green and piled with comfortable looking throw pillows. The coffee table was stacked with magazines, and there was a cosy armchair with a floor lamp next to it. It looked like an excellent place to curl up and read. Interesting. In... Is that... Hmm. I'm just thinking of, like, Midnight Motorist and the sister location. Uh, TV thingy. I, I, I don't think it's anything, actually. No, it, it, there's no TV there. It didn't even mention a TV. What am I talking about? While Jake looked around, Ronell walked through the room as though it were an art gallery. She seemed happy to be home. Jake ga uh, gazed past her and saw a wall of photographs. He took a step toward it. The first photo he spotted was one of two men, both wearing lab coats. One had a long, craggy face and greying, bushy black hair. The other had a round face and short grey hair. Jake knew the second man. Ha! Huh. Jake knew the second man. The one with short grey... is it? Huh. Is it Phineas? Is it Dr. Phineas? Huh. He had put together the endoskeleton that Jake was in. Oh, right. It was Phineas, yeah. I, I, sorry, I just did not read. Uh, Phineas Taggart. Was that the name, by the way? Taggart? Oh no, it was Talbert. Sorry, I, I'm really slow today. I, I've read a lot in the past few days. <laughs> In the weeks since Jake had found himself in his metal body, he discovered that the man's name was Dr. Phineas Taggart. Ronell's dad was Taggart's friend? Oh, okay, Jake... Wait! So is Taggart a William parallel? And... No, wait, no, never mind. <laughs> Jake continued to examine the photos on the wall. Then he spied something that would, sm that would have made his stomach churn, if he had had one. In one of the photos, Dr. Talbert was smiling happily with a preteen girl. The girl had curly black hair and dark brown eyes. She looked just like Dr. Talbert, her dad. But wait, Jake thought, looking back and forth between the photo and the girl standing in front of it. Ronell doesn't have curly black hair or dark brown eyes. She doesn't look anything at all like the girl in the picture. Ooh. Ooh, so is Ronell a faker? Ronell's a faker. 
This is really interesting. Larson parked on the street in front of the strange blocky house. Chance to see the corn pone cowboy might be annoying, but he was amazing at research. Larson walked across the concrete front yard. He guessed it saved time on mowing and found the front door standing open. It seemed like an invitation. He stepped into the foyer and stood frozen, unable to believe what was in front of him. There was the familiar white face with sunken black eyes, the endoskeleton body, the stitch wraith. Standing next to it was a young girl with unwashed hair braided into pigtails. Her clothes were worn and dirty, but she was otherwise... Uh, she was otherwise seemed normal. But what happened next was anything but normal. The girl was staring at a photo of a younger girl, a pre-teen with curly black hair, and then suddenly she was that girl. Small, black-haired, adorable, and innocent-looking. Innocent-looking, but not innocent. Larson felt his insides turn to jelly. It was happening. Another one of his visions. He felt himself sinking into it, quicksand-like. He was unable to lift himself out, no matter how badly he wanted to. As he stared at the newly transformed girl, the mask she had created for herself fell away. He no longer saw the smiling face of a curly-haired child, but another face that was all too familiar. The sickly skull-like shape, the painted pink circle cheeks, the red mouth with its twisted teeth, the heart-shaped pendant which appeared to pulse and throb. It was her from the picture, the clown peeking over the disappeared girl's shoulder. Out of nowhere, a name popped into his head. Eleanor. <laughs> he could see her, but he could see into her too. And what he saw was a black chaotic force that fed on human suffering. The fear, the pain, the death. She, not the stitch wraith, was the cause of it. In both his head and his heart, Larson knew this to be true. He was surer of it than he had been of anything in his life. He was also sure that he drew his gun and took aim. The girl's eyes met his. She smiled. The room fell away, as did everything familiar. Larson's eyelids fluttered, then shut, and he fell to the floor with a thud. Eleanor, he whispered before he lost consciousness. What? Ah! <laughs> no, Larson is dead? Larson can't be dead. dead. Okay. It was dark, but there was an eerie glow, as if a neon, si uh, a neon sign was shining from outside a window. But there were no windows. There was nothing. A void. Larson blinked hard, trying to adjust his eyesight. Then he saw her just a few feet ahead of him. She was standing in front of a table. Her back was turned, but her identity was unmistakable. Her, the red pink tails, the long neck, the curves of the robotic body. He stepped closer. She was working on something so intently, she didn't seem to notice him behind her. He drew nearer. The object that was taking up all her attention was a hideous plush toy. Its long ears uh, suggested it was a rabbit though it was certainly the least cute stuffed bunny Larson had ever seen. And what in the world was she doing with it? With one hand, she held its jaws open wider than seemed possible. With the other, she was shoving something into its mouth, something that made an unpleasant squishy sound as she pressed it down. What is going on? <laughs> Stepping a bit closer, Larson saw it was a tooth, one in a row of bloody human teeth that occupied the thing's lower jaw. It, wait, Larson saw it was a tooth. What, is in like the tooth from He Told Me Everything? No, I'm joking. Uh, its eyes, Larson noted, uh, noticed, were wet looking. Their whites streaked with red blood vessels. Human eyes. It felt like they were staring at him. The clown girl laughed, turned around to face him. Then she was gone. Larson felt the floor upturned beneath him. It tilted so far that he started sliding backward. He struggled to find his balance. Once he got his footing and the full floor beneath him felt level again, he looked around to see what uh, to see he was in a room, though an unfamiliar one. It was a small, modest living room, an ugly, fanned, handmade af afghan was draped over the couch. What? Afghan? What's what's that? Uh, on the coffee table was a glass about one fourth full of milk and a saucer with cookie crumbs on it. Where was he? He looked around, trying to orient himself. The digital clock on the stove in the kitchen announced the time as 1.35am. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm so lost. 
I'm so lost. I'm so confused. I don't want to read this anymore because I'm so confused of what's happening. Wow. Okay, so Eleanor's creating an illusion, right? And Eleanor's the bad guy in all of this, not the stitch wraith. I think Larson knows that. 1.35 a.m. Why 1.35 a.m.? Okay, well, there was a sound, a frantic scratching, like there was an animal trapped behind the closed door of another room. It's obviously the Ella doll. A little apprehensively, Larson opened it to let out the cat or dog. But there was no cat or dog, and the scratching continued insistently from inside the room. Larson stood in the doorway and peeked inside. The scratching was coming from outside the window. Framed in the window was the clown-like face with the circle cheeks and red grin. She was staring at the window with her metal fingertips. In the bed, a young woman sat up clutch clutching her covers, her eyes wide with terror. Is that... is that... um... uh... Oh, what's her name? What's her name? Uh... From the from the one thirty five a.m. story. What is her name? Oh my god! I cannot believe I don't remember her name. As I said, my brain is kind of dead right now, because I've read all of this in like the space of twenty four hours, basically. Oh, not twenty four hours, forty eight hours. Um. Yeah. You need to get out of here, Larson said to the woman. You're in danger. She didn't look in his direction, didn't seem able to see or hear him. Instead, she looked around frantically without stopping to rest her gaze on either Larson or the murderous creature in the window, muttering, It's the doll. It's the doll. The floor rose up again, the bedroom fell away, and Larson felt himself falling too. Is, is, oh, is Eleanor showing Larson basically all of her victims or something? Was, was Ella, no, not Ella, uh, Eleanor, wait! Wait, Ella? Eleanor? Very similar name. No, I'm joking, actually. I wasn't joking, but they could be kind of similar. I think Eleanor was in charge of a lot of these stories. Was that was the bad guy behind a lot of these stories? Wow, okay. If this is true. He was standing in the doorway of an operating room. Is this step closer? He was standing in the doorway of an operating room. Two men in surgical scrubs stood over a table on which a motionless young boy was strapped. His eyes were wide, were open wide and stayed open even after one of the surgeons tried to close them. Behind the boy's head, holding him down on the shoulders, was the smiling clown girl. One of the surgeons turned on a small buzz, saw... One of the surgeons turned on a small buzz, saw that word menacingly. Oh, buzz saw, sorry, buzz saw, word menacingly. Somehow Larson knew that this surgery wasn't going to save the boy. Instead, it was something the boy needed saving from. It was Eleanor who was putting him in danger. Larson burst into the room, prepared to save the boy if he could. But when Larson reached the operating table, the boy wasn't there. The surgeons were gone, and on the table was a man. Or what was left of a man. The boy appeared to have been burnt, almost beyond recognition. Hairless, faceless, almost skinless, except for a translucent layer through which the pulsing of his organs were visible. This is either the man in room 1280 or a Fazgu creature, right? Uh, as Larson breathed in at the shocking sight, his nose filled with a sickly smell of charred flesh. Yeah, it, it's the man in room 1280. What am I all about? Sweet, meaty and acrid, all at the same time. He retched and took a step back. As he tried to recover, Larson became aware of a sound, a rustling, a whisper that seemed to be coming from the man's body. The, man li the man's lipless mouth did not move. The sound seemed to be coming from within his chest. Larson leaned down to listen right above the man's visible beating heart. Wait! What if... This is an insane theory right here. This could be the, the worst theory in my life, but let me... Let me Give me a second here. What if any child in any of these stories that has black curly hair is Eleanor? No, that's a stupid theory, isn't it? What I'm trying to say is there are a lot of curly black haired people, right? And obviously people tie that to Cassidy because Cassidy means long black curly hair or whatever. Uh, oh no, I think it just means curly hair, but anyway. Oh, no, that, I don't, I don't think that theory is true. I don't know. There's something going on here, and 
it's something big, and I think it's going to explain literally everything in the, in this series. So I'm so super excited to read the rest of this. Um, uh, where was I? I actually don't know where I was, so I'm just going to carry on. As he tried to recover, Larson became aware of a sound, a rustling, a whisper. That seemed to be coming from the man's body. The man's lipless mouth did not move. The sound seemed to be coming from within his chest. Larson leaned down to listen right above the man's visible beating heart. A pair of metal hands gripped Larson's shoulders, and a familiar face burst from the uh, burned man's body cavity. The pink cheek circles were made of the man's tissue. The mouth and teeth were red with blood. The strong metal hands dragged Larson inside the burnt, the burned man's body. What is going on here? The strong metal hands... Okay. There was only darkness. He tried to feel what was around him, but only grasped air. There was a whooshing sound, and he was standing at the entrance of a maze lit by black light. It was clearly some kind of kid's game. There were colourful cutouts of buildings, like a school... And a firehouse, this is hide and seek lads. But someone must have gotten rough with the game because some of the cutouts have been knocked down and patches were on the walls to repair damage. And there she was in the middle of the maze, like a minotaur, winking and giving a jaunty little wave before she took off at a run. So she was behind hide and seek? He chased her, but he was a man, not a machine. And he was physically and mentally exhausted. He wasn't sure how long he could keep up the chase. He made a left, then a right, then another right, trying to remember the directions in case he got lost and needed to backtrack. His eyes ached from the harshness of the black light. Oh my god. Larson made another right and ran into a boy. Well, the body of a boy. The boy was hanging from the wall with wooden pegs driven through his back. Clearly that's Toby. Uh, a puddle of blood had gathered on the floor below his sneakers. Larson felt he might be sick again. He turned his head from the upsetting sight and saw Eleanor leaning in the doorway, smiling as if she were looking on a happy scene. This is my dream, by the way. Every single story, like, gone through, but in the epilogue, discreetly. This, this is like a dream to me. For some reason, the dead boy was smiling too, as if he and the clown girl were sharing a private joke. Oh. The floor flipped up like a trapdoor. Larson fell hard and was surprised to feel grass and dirt beneath him. It was dark, and the air was cool and breezy. Outside, he was outside. But where? He stood and tried to shake off his disorientation. He was standing a few feet away from a railroad track. A figure was visible, standing on the tracks. He moved closer. Wait, there were two figures. Is this, uh, is this out of stock? Or is this Blackbird? One was the... Wait, yeah. One was the horribly, horrible monstrosity he'd been chasing in whatever alternate reality or break with reality he was experiencing. The other, held in the arms of the first, was a kid in some kind of costume. What? This is crazy! This is the craziest epilogue. Eleanor spun him... So, obviously, this is Blackbird. Eleanor spun him around, uh, no doubt making him dizzy and disoriented. The kid struggled and fought, kicking his long legs. Was he dressed as a bird? But he was tangled in this costume and couldn't get himself free. In the distance, Larson heard the whistle of a train. He ran to the tracks. Eleanor turned her head and locked eyes with Larson. She let go of her victim, jumped up and took off across a nearby field. The kid in the strange bird costume was still on the tracks, tangled in his weird bird suit and disoriented. Larson pushed him off the tracks. He landed in a ditch but at least he wasn't in the path of the train. Larson waited while the train roared past, then started running across the field where Eleanor had headed, but soon it was apparent that it was too late. She was gone. Larson stood in the dark field, unsure of where he was or when it was. This is insane. What? Jake looked over at the creature he could only think of not Ronell, of as not Ronell. Hang on a second, hang on a second, not Ronell? That, is that a reference to sea bonnies? Oh my god, <laughs> oh my god. Uh, then he looked down at the body of the police officer he had once saved. The guy had just wandered into the house and passed out, hitting his head on the floor and whispering the name Eleanor. Too many weird things were happening all at once. 
Ronell. Wait, hang on, hang on. Hitting his hand on the floor and whispering the name Eleanor. Too many with. Oh, right, yeah, okay. Uh, Ronell cried the same booming voice that had been called out when the front door had opened. Jake turned again and watched the bushy haired man from the photo rush toward Ronell. Not Ronell. Dr. Talbot wrapped his arms around his fake daughter and squeezed her hard. Tears streamed down his lined face. I'm so happy you're home. I thought I'd lost you forever. The doctor was so focused on the girl in his arms that he didn't even look at Jake, but the girl did. Not Ronell looked directly at Jake and she winked. Eleanor, Jake said. Eleanor grinned. The grin was even more triumphant than the wink. Jake didn't hesitate. He launched himself at Eleanor and knocked her back into a wall of shelves. As the metal contents of the shelves cascaded down on Jake and Eleanor, Jake thought about the last time he'd seen the thing that had pretended to be Ronell. The last time he'd seen her, she'd been freeing herself from the trash rabbit. She was in the thing that had disappeared into the vent opening. Yes! Yeah! Yeah, she was! He could still hear her horrible cackle in his mind. Jake knew now that he'd been right. This thing, Eleanor, not the man named Afton, had been the thing powering the giant monster. Afton, while unimaginably evil, had been too weak at the time. Eleanor had given him his last burst of strength, but he failed, and she escaped, and now she'd tricked Jake into bringing her here for some reason. What did she want from him? Theory time! What if Ronell is a parallel? to, or, or Eleanor is a parallel to Vanny, and she's trying to bring back Afton. That is an insane theory, I think. And it's clear here, it's, it's clear that the, the, the villain of Fazbear Frights was from the second story in the entire series. It seemed like, it seems like the first story into the pit was probably the most important story, and the second story was the second most important story, with, with the introduction of Eleanor, who is the main villain. This is a huge reveal, if this is true. Oh my god. Wow. Whatever, re whatever her reasons for bringing him here, they couldn't be good. Jake figured if he, was, if he attacked her before she saw it coming, he might be able to stop whatever it was she was planning. But he hadn't counted on how clever and manipulative she was. Jake had done nothing but knock Eleanor into the shelves. However, when she screamed and tore he away from him, she had a stab wound in her belly. It was ble bleeding heavily. Jake knew he hadn't stabbed Eleanor. He looked down and checked to be sure some part of him hadn't done it accidentally. He looked for sharp edges, for evidence that he had done damage. Nope, he had no blood on him at all. She'd done it to herself. And it had the effect Jake was sure she'd planned. Dr. Talbert cried out in rage, reached into the desk drawer and grabbed something Jake couldn't see. That something turned out to be a gun, as Jake discovered when Dr. Talbert fired three shots at him. What? So Dr. Talbert is bad, they're working together. Oh my god. Oh my god. So, okay, okay, okay. So, let's get it straight, let's simplify this. So Dr. Talbert's daughter is supposedly Ronell, who is Eleanor, okay? Eleanor is against Jake, because she's the main villain of all of this, right? Dr. Talbert, her dad, had been experimenting with Remnant, and now Dr. Talbert is against Jake. So, is Dr. Talbert a parallel to Afton, and Eleanor a parallel to Vanny, or something like that? Something like that. Right? Because how? why is Dr. Talbert bad? Oh my god, okay. Fired three shots at him. He, clearly he was trying to find out things about Remnant for a bad reason, right? Two of the shots pinged harmlessly off Jake's metal, but the third shot hit his endoskeleton's battery. Jake crumpled to the floor, the energy sucked out of him. As soon as Jake was down, Dr. Talbert rushed to his daughter. Oh, there we go, his daughter. I'll be right back, Ronell, he said. He left the room and quickly reappeared, pushing a rolling metal table. He picked her up effortlessly and laid her on it. Hang on, Ronell, he said. I can save you. Remnant will save you. Jake couldn't move, but he could hear and see. He wanted with all his will to say, that's not your daughter, but he couldn't speak. As soon as Dr. Talbert said, Remnant, Eleanor smiled. She wanted Remnant. That's why, 
That was why she had tricked Jake into being her here, into bringing her here. But what was Remnant? And why did she want it? No! I know what's going to happen. Dr. Talbot is going to take Jake's Remnant from the Stitch Wraith and put it in... Eleanor? No, actually no, that makes no sense. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But what was Remnant, and why did she want it? Flashes of the memories he felt when he was near her gave him glimpses into its nature. He couldn't hear her thoughts exactly, but he could feel the words. Power. Life. Eternal. Oh, okay. V very nice words there. Uh, the doctor put a pillow under he Eleanor's head and said, Just relax, I'll be right back. He ran from the room, then returned with a mo rolling metal tray containing beakers of bubbling. Thick silver liquid. That's remnant. He pulled the tray up to next to the table. While Eleanor looked at the liquid and smiled wildly, uh, widely, sorry, Dr. Talbot took out his phone and punched in a number. Security, I've had a break in, thank you. Yes, now. Dr. Talbot glanced at Jake. He hadn't seemed to notice the unconscious man on the floor. Eleanor gazed at the bubbling liquid as if it were the most precious thing in the world. Jake couldn't move. All he could do was watch Dr. Talbot begin hooking up tubing to the containers of the liquid substance. Dr. Talbot glanced at Jake one more time. Then he prepared an IV to transfer the liquid into the thing he thought was his daughter. Jake tried to will himself to move, but will without physical power was useless. The detective's eyelids fluttered and he mem mumbled something incoherent, but he did not regain consciousness. Eleanor locked eyes with Jake. She was still smiling. Of course she's smiling, Jake thought. She won. Something was changing. Eleanor's human disguise was disintegrating. The dark, curly hair fell from her scalp, but disappeared before it hit the floor. The healthy-looking pink ting, wait, pink-tinged flesh on her face melted away to reveal a thin layer of sickly grey skin. Dr. Talbot drew back in horror. Eleanor's huge, dead eyes bulged and her red-stained mouth gaped, revealing the vicious zigzag of her teeth. She looked at Jake, her eyes pulsating, her unhinged jaw opening wide. Oh, I don't want that to be it. I don't want that to be the last line. Oh. So right now, we've got the villains, Eleanor primarily and Dr. Talbot, who is infusing her with Remnant or something. So that she can be stronger, I assume. She can be immortal. I don't know. Um, and next to them, laying on the floor, is Larson, who is in an illusion. And is just in the middle of the field somewhere. When he's actually just lying down unconscious uh, on the floor next to Eleanor. And, of course, Jake, who whose battery is out, basically. And can't move, but can hear and see everything. Wow. Okay, I just want to say, that epilogue was the best thing that I have ever read out of these books. I'm not even kidding, okay? My favourite stories before this were The Real Jake and In the Flesh, mainly. Um, they were written exquisitely. All of the stories are written so well. But the fact that in this one, we got a crossover between like, literally like 20 stories. The fact that we got that crossover is incredible to me. And it makes me feel like in the last epilogue, the next and the last epilogue, we're going to get everything revealed. Okay. And everything is going to connect. It's going to be very nice. We're going to find out what Eleanor's true motive is. And we're going to find out how Eleanor pulled this off if she is the one behind a lot of these Fazbear Fright stories. Anyway, this has given me something to work on. Uh, I am really intrigued now. I kind of just want to read all of the stories again and see if I can spot anything out of place. Um, I mean, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. I'm really curious now. Oh my god. Epilogue. <sighs> blow out the candles, blow out the candles, Jake's friends 
wearing pointy cardboard party hats, surrounded him at the table. Right in front of him was a round, white frosted cake decorated with nine rainbow coloured candles. Somehow Jake knew that the cake was red velvet with cream cheese frosting, his favourite. Jake laughed at his friend's cheers, took a deep breath, and then huffed and puffed like the big bad wolf in The Three Little Pigs. He extinguished all the candles at once. Jake's heart was full of happiness. There were smiling faces all around him, smiling faces that were soon to be stuffed with cake and ice cream. But wait, none of this was real. It wasn't even a memory. Jake needed to wake up. He wasn't safe where he was in real life, and this dream had lured him into a, self, into a false sense of security. And yet it was so tempting to stay where he was now, where everything felt so happy and cosy. No, you have to wake up. Larson has found his way out of the field. He wasn't sure that wandering the streets aimlessly was an improvement over wandering through a field, but at least the lighting was better, and there was no danger of stepping in a cow pie. <laughs> There had to be some way of getting out of whatever this weird space was and back into reality. An idea popped into Larson's head. Of course, the ball pit. Maybe the ball pit where he had gotten the blood samples was the connection, the portal, that would bring him back to real life. As soon as he had the thought, it was like his feet automatically knew where to go. He walked several blocks, despite none of the landmarks being familiar, until he came to the site of the ball pit. Freddy Fazbear's, as it had been. The place was hopping, parents and children were spilling in and out of the doors, and even from the sidewalk, he could hear how loud the place was, the bleeps and blips of all the games, the music, the kids laughing and screaming with excitement. As soon as he entered the pizzeria, he could feel people's judgmental stares. It was weird enough for an adult man to come into a Freddy Fazbear's by himself, but it was even weirder when he looked as rough as Larson did. He was still bleeding from his injuries, and his white shirt was stained red. He was sweaty from his exertions, and he knew he stank. It was no wonder the patrons of Freddy's were giving him a wide berth. But that was okay. He hadn't come here to make a good impression. He had come to find the bull pit, and there it was. But it was a very different bull pit from the filthy one where he had collected the blood samples. This version of the bull pit was clean and new, the balls were bright primary colours, and the pit was full of laughing children, wadding or wading, sorry, wadding, wading, wading or swimming through the balls, sometimes throwing them at one another, even though there was a sign saying you weren't supposed to. Please, I need everybody to get out of the ball pit, please, Larson says loudly enough. He hoped to be heard over the games and music and voices. He wasn't. So he said it again, even louder, and flashed his badge. This time the kids looked at him and made their way toward the ball pit's exit. Larson figured they were probably acting out of a desire to get away from him one uh, to get away from him more than a wish to be obedient. But hey, whatever worked. Larson climbed into the pit. He could feel the confused stares of kids and their parents. He relaxed his knees and let himself sink down until he was shoulder deep in brightly coloured plastic balls. Something about it felt like sinking into a bubble bath. But nothing about this was giving him any information that might help him back, get back to where he needed to be. I need to go further down, he said to the onlooking parents and children. He wasn't sure why he felt the need to explain himself to them, especially when his words would only confuse them. He burrowed deeper into the ball pit until he was completely buried and surrounded by darkness. Then suddenly, it wasn't dark anymore. It was bright and sunny, and when Larson took a deep breath, his lungs filled with fresh air. He was walking down the sidewalk in a residential section of a pleasant town. The houses on the street were quaint bungalows, and the yards were well tended, with mowed grass and cheerful flower beds. The more he walked, the more familiar the town seemed. He suddenly remembered a newspaper clipping he'd seen a while back. In a few steps, he saw something he de definitely recognised from the clipping. A junkyard! Somehow he knew this was the place. Once again, his feet led him as if they had exact knowledge of his needed destination. Inside the junkyard, Larson walked past piles of old tyres and broken electronics and cast off furniture until he came to an old beaten up car. Without even consciously thinking about what he was doing, he reached down and opened the truck. Eleanor leaped out in a fury, her jagged teeth bared, her hands um, shaped into claws. 
She pounced on him and knocked him down, scratching at him with her metal fingers, unhinging her jaws and snapping at his throat. Eleanor was strong, but also lightweight, so Larson managed to throw her off him and into a trash pile. He struggled to his feet just in time for her to come at him again, this time wielding a tire iron she had found. She swung it and it connected with his jaw. For a second, he was blinded by pain. He was pretty sure she had loosened a tooth or two. He shook off the pain and managed to wrest the tire iron from her grip. He swung it hard and connected with her face. But she just laughed, a horrible high-pitched cackle that made him shiver. He tossed away the tire iron. It was no use to him, but definitely needed to be kept out of her reach. Then he saw something a few yards away that might be useful. The trash compactor that was used to crush large metal items into smaller, more manageable cubes for disposal. He imagined Eleanor crushed to the form of a harmless cube, and, also, and almost smiled. Here we go. He took off running in the direction of the trash compactor in hopes that she would chase him there. I've got something for you to chew on, he taunted her. You stupid, luck, useless doll. The heart-shaped necklace around Eleanor's throat pulsed and glowed blood red. Eleanor let out a horrible shriek, a warrior's cry, and charged at him. When she reached him, he grabbed her by the arm and shoved it into the waiting jaws of the trash compactor. Soon, there were only the sounds of crunching metal and Eleanor's blood-curdling streaks. What the hell? <laughs> Larson woke up, lying on the floor in the house where he'd passed out. Oh, damn it. It was all just a dream or a thought, you know, coma. He looked up to see Eleanor still on the table. Her face was a mask of rage. In her anger, she was losing the appearance of the curly-haired girl and, losing, and looking more like the deranged mannequin she really was. Her eyes were dark wells of anger. Rennell? The man who thought he was her father said. Rennell? What's happening to you? Eleanor slowly opened her mouth, impossibly wide. Gooey black tendrils shot from it, slithered across the floor, then twisted around Larson, binding him. The tendrils were sticky and smelled like copper. Blood, thought Larson. They're made of blood. As soon as he thought this, he was back in the other place again, walking the streets. But this time he knew what to do. The bull pit. He, found Ele he had found Eleanor there before, and he would find her there again, and he would destroy her. The former pizzeria was a dark, empty space with filthy, cracked windows. Strangely, the front door was unlocked, as if someone had been expecting him. There were a few broken arcade cabinets and smashed up tables and chairs. The walls had been covered with graffiti, but the ball pit was there in its regular place. Larson stepped inside the pit. The plastic balls were sticky and adhered to his clothes and skin. They smelled of decay. He held his nose like he was jumping into a pool and sank beneath the surface. Larson emerged into a dark room. Something metal brushed against his cheek. It felt like it could be the pull chain for a light fixture. He reached up and pulled it, and a bare, dim bulb cast a faint glow over the room. The walls were bare wood and sloped like the contours of a roof, and the room was cluttered with cardboard boxes and plastic tubs labelled winter clothes, Christmas decorations, and fishing poles or tackle. There was an old rocking chair and a table full of knick-knacks, figurines, a large brass candelabra, a glass paperweight, the kind of stuff that nobody really needed but that people had a hard time letting go of for some reason. A large antique trunk sat in the far left corner of the room. Larson had a feeling that the truck was hiding something other than useless bric-a-brac. With dread, he walked towards it. Eleanor was lying, curled up, in the trunk with her, leg with her knees hugged to her chest. Her eyes flew open. She propelled herself out of the trunk and onto Larson, her cold metal hands encircling his throat. Larson grabbed her by the wrists, trying to loosen her grip but she only grabbed on tighter. Choking and sputtering, he staggered backward, bumping on t into the table. He grabbed blindly at the table's surface and, ga and grasped the heavy, weight paper <laughs> the heavy glass paperweight. Sorry. He raised it up and brought it down hard on Eleanor's forehead, rattling her enough to make her lose her grip on his throat. Maybe paperweights weren't so useless after all. She shook her head like she was disoriented, then she came at him again, this time with her jaw unhinged, exposing her sharp, jagged teeth. 
Larson grabbed the candelabra from the table and swung it hard, hitting her in the head and knocking her to the floor. He hit her face again and again until the thin layer of stickly greyish skin was nothing but pulp and a silver skull was exposed beneath. Oh my god. Larson was on the floor in the house again. Looking up, he saw Eleanor on the table. Her eyes were still closed, but her body was anything but relaxed. Her fists were clenched, her teeth gritted, and she shook her head back and forth as if she was saying, no, no, no. Near Larson, on the floor, the stitch wraith had started to move, slowly scooting itself toward the table where Eleanor lay. Larson blinked, and just like that, he was on the streets again. He knew what he had to do. This time, the pizzeria was called Papa Bear's Pancake House, the windows were hung with red and white gingham curtains that matched the wipeable plastic tablecloths. Only one table was occupied, with a family of four ploughing through some pancakes. Near the coffee station, two servers in white, red and white gingham uh, aprons chatted. He was relieved they hadn't noticed him yet. He looked in the back corner of the restaurant. Fortunately, the ball pit was still there, and the plastic balls were in a much more pristine state than they had been on his last visit. He went under. He was in a kid's bedroom, a little boy's from the look of it. The comforter on the bed was light blue and decorated with race cars, a poster showing Freddy Fazbear and his friends hung on his wall over his bed. There were no kids around now, but the room brought Larson back to all those times he had checked under Ryan's bed for monsters. He'd always told Ryan there was no such thing. He was wrong. Larson sensed Eleanor's presence. He dropped to his knees and lifted the bed skirt. Nothing. He pulled back the floor-length curtains in case she was hiding behind them. Nothing there either. But as soon as he saw the closet, he knew she was there. He opened the door and a pair of metallic hands shot out, pulling him inside the dark, tiny space. Eleanor grabbed Larson by the shoulders and slammed his head into the closet wall over and over and over until all he could feel was white-hot pain. He managed to jab an elbow into her belly, which knocked her off balance and freed him. He stumbled out of the closet and picked up an aluminium bat that had been stored with the other athletic gear. He dragged Eleanor out of the closet by her wrist, then swung the bat at her head like he was trying his best for a home run. The force of the blow knocked her head off her partially, so it dangled crazily from her neck by just a few wires. Larson took another swing, this one even harder, which served Eleanor's head entirely. On the table, Eleanor was writhing as if in agony. The stitch wraith had dragged itself all the way to the table and appeared to be uh, trying to summon the strength to pull itself up to a standing position. Oh my god. Larson was pounding the pavement again, already walking the well-worn path to the home of the bull pit. This time the restaurant was little more than a dark, empty hole with broken windows and graffiti. Most of it, uh, most of what had been inside had either been stripped away or smashed. But the ball pit was still there, dusty and dilapidated, the plastic walls covered with an unsightly gunk that had rendered them all the same indeterminate colour. It smelled of rot and something worse. Larson breathed in and out through his mouth and tried to stifle his gag reflex. He went under. The space was huge and cavernous. Moonlight steamed in from a skylight above. It looked like a warehouse of some kind, though it didn't seem to be storing anything in it these days. An old mattress and some sleeping bags in a corner suggested that someone could have made the place their temporary home. Larson looked around at the large empty space. There weren't many places to hide. Then he heard laughter, the high-pitched cackle that made the tiny hairs on the back of his neck stand up. It was coming from above him. She was peeking through the open skylight. She dropped downward, landing on Larson, knocking the wind out of him. He lay flat on his back. What is going on? There's so much. Oh my god. Jake was so weak he struggled to pull himself up, but he used the metal table to steady himself and soon he was standing. When he saw Eleanor, he felt a surge of rage that gave him the strength to climb onto the table. He loomed over Eleanor and tried to muster the strength to do what he had to do. Eleanor did not seem fully awake, but her face was changing. Her eyes bulged. Black tentacles shot from her mouth, from her fingers, from her toes. What is this? The slimy black vines climbed up the walls and slithered over the floor. Tentacles flew from her and wrapped around his face until he couldn't see. In the warehouse, Larson tried to push Eleanor off him, but she had him pinned, and she leaned down and bit his cheek, drawing blood, then laughing. He shivered from the sound and the pain. 
Larson managed to roll over so that he was now on top of Eleanor, his hands closed around her throat. In the living room, Jake dodged the black blood that spewed from Eleanor's nose and mouth. Eleanor sat bolt upright and grabbed his neck with both hands. Jake felt a sudden surge of strength. He pulled her hands away as if he were doing something, as if he were doing nothing more strenuous than swatting a fly. Holding Eleanor's wrists, Jake loomed over her, her eyes, his, his eyes burning with fury. He leaned over her until her face and torso were covered by his cloak. She twisted and kicked, but he just pressed in closer, eyes blazing with fury, burning into Eleanor until she was still. Jake knew that only he could hear Eleanor's roaring fury now. She wasn't animated anymore. She was part of Jake, the way Andrew had been. But she wasn't like Andrew. Andrew hadn't been nice, exactly. He had been as full of rage as Eleanor was, but Andrew had just been hurt. He hadn't been bad at the core. Eleanor was bad at the core, but she had no power here. Jake concentrated until he was able to access Eleanor's memories, if they could be called memories. Using the ability that Jake had discovered after his confrontation with the trash rabbit, Jake reached into those years and found a moment of seething anger and anguish. He figured if he could stuff Eleanor into a bubble of that moment, he could subdue her. He was right. With that one intention, Eleanor was defeated, contained. Her foul spirit folded in on itself and was silenced. When Jake saw her lying on the table, she had the dry, withered appearance of an ancient mummy. She was more than dead. She was empty. A husk. Exhausted, Jake lay back and let his mind go blank. Oh my god. That's it. <laughs> Two weeks later. Here we go. Hopefully, hopefully something big happens here. Come on. Two weeks later, Larson was no longer destined to wander around lost in different places and times. He was in the here and now, which in this case was the ball field at the time of his son's game. The air was crisp, but the sky was so blue it looked like the painted backdrop of a play. Larson's fight with Eleanor had opened some stitches, so he was bandaged up again. Stiff and sore, Larson gingerly climbed into the bleachers and took a seat at the end of a row. He looked out over the green diamond. There was Ryan. He was in the outfield, and as often was the case with Ryan, he looked bored. He was playing with his baseball glove and kicking at the grass with one shoe, which appeared to be untied. Larson grinned when Ryan looked up into the stands and spotted his dad. Ryan waved widely, and Larson waved back. Then Larson pointed at the batter, still grinning. Ryan nodded and focused on the task at hand. The batter at the plate took a swing and connected. Crack! Under the bright sun, the ball soared toward the outfield. Larson stood, cheering when his son caught the ball. Jake wasn't sure why he'd felt so drawn to the abandoned restaurant, but he did. So much so that with what little strength he had, he had left, he'd painstakingly made his way across town to get here. His battery had recharged, just a little, enough for him to walk, but his walk was actually more of a shuffle. He wasn't going to make it far. Every movement took all the strength Jake possessed. Now Jake pushed inside the empty building. His feet dragged across the dusty floor as he aimed toward his destination. In a way, she was leading him here, he knew, but not really. She had no will left. He was in control, but he'd learnt enough about her as he'd overcome her to know that this was where she had to be laid to rest. Jake shuffled across a barren dining room and made his way to the ball pit he'd been seeing in his mind's eye since he'd integrated Eleanor's remains into his consciousness. It was a horrible place, he could tell. Not just that it looked horrible, all dusty and faded and smelling of decay, but it it was horrible. It was like a graveyard for the souls of victims of a wicked wrongness that he didn't fully understand. What had happened here? Where did Eleanor come from? Had she caused all this chaos, or had the chaos somehow caused her? Jake paused in front of the dingy yellow rope that warned away anyone crazy enough to come in here and tried to enter this pit of terror and pain. This was where Jake had to be, to do the last bit of good he could do. It felt kind of like the end but he hoped it was going to be more of a beginning, the start of the one journey he really wanted to take. He'd finished everything he had to do. 
He'd managed to reunite Dr. Talbot with his real daughter, and he found the real homeless girl Eleanor had replaced. The real girl with the reddish brown hair had been locked in a trunk in an abandoned building where Jake could have originally found Eleanor. Despite her terror at being rescued by him, he'd made sure she got to a hospital. Jake stepped into the bull pit, and as soon as he did, the pit started talking, uh, taking to him. He let the bull pit pull him down, and down, and down. It felt like... It felt kind of like sinking into a pool of water. All he had to do was relax and let himself drift downward. So that's what he did. He sank lower and lower. As soon as he did, he was no longer aware of the pit. He wasn't aware of anything physical at all. What? What? Hold on. What? What? <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. So that's what he did. He sank lower and lower. As soon as he did, he was no longer aware of the pit. He wasn't aware of anything physical at all. Millie flinched. Why is Millie back? Oh my god. Yes. Count the ways is canon. Yes. Count the ways is in the stitch verse. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is crazy. This is big. Okay. What well, is this going to say? Is Millie dead? Is Millie dead or not? Millie flinched when a low-hanging fir branch brushed against her cheek. She battered it away and peered into the darkness beyond it. Where is her grandpa's house? Wait, what? She'd just been there, hadn't she? How could she have gotten this lost? Wait, she so she was never in the Funtime Freddy? Okay. Millie tugged her black sweater tighter around her. She rubbed her arms to get warm. She felt really chilled, even though the night wasn't that cold. Before she left the house, she hadn't wanted to be at the stupid Christmas dinner with all her stupid relatives. But now, for reasons she didn't understand, that was the only place she wanted to be. And of course, because she wanted it, she couldn't have it. She never got what she wanted. She was always forced to do what everyone else wanted her to do. Her parents, her grandpa, the teachers at school. It wasn't fair. Nearby, a crow cord. Millie jumped and spun around. She heard the rustling in the undergrowth and she tried to see into the darkness. When nothing moved, she started walking again. Millie thought she'd only been out here for a few minutes. So why did it feel like she'd been wandering for a very long time? Before she could ponder that question, the foliage rustled again. And this time, a hand reached through it. Millie gasped and stopped dead. A little boy was stepping out from the middle of a huckleberry bush. Millie stared at him, poised to run if he was a threat. He didn't look like a threat though. With a round freckled face, bright green eyes, a big smile, and a thick tangle of brown curls that fell into his eyes, the boy looked really nice actually. Millie found herself smiling at him, in spite of herself. You lost? the boy asked. Millie shook her head even though she was. I'm Jake. <laughs> the boy said. Then he took Millie's hand. To her surprise, Millie didn't resist at all. Instead, she let the boy, Jake, lead her through the woods. He didn't lead her for long though. In what felt like an instant, Jake was there and then gone. He disappeared and Millie found herself on, the grand on her grandpa's front porch. What? Okay. Through the big picture window, Millie could see her family gathering uh, um, uh, around the table. Behind them, the Christmas tree was lit up, just like it had been when she'd left the house. And for some reason, Millie was happy to see it. She was happy to see her family too. Not sure why she felt so good all of a sudden, but not really caring. Millie rushed across the porch. She threw open the door and ran into the room. Her grandpa greeted her with a hug and a smile, which Millie, for once, was happy to receive. For the first time she could remember, Millie felt like she was home. Okay. Oh, is it going to be a sort of thing where it's like, Eleanor was cursing all of these stories, but Jake was saving all of the people in them. That would be, that'd be kind of cool. Inside the abandoned restaurant, dust motes danced in the silence. The bull pit hunkered in the corner as usual, totally still. Or maybe not totally. Although the plastic balls weren't moving, suddenly one of them lit up. 
lit up and turned from ready red to shining gold. Then it turned clear, like a sparkling crystal ball. Within the glistening glass orb, a tiny scene fled into view. The scene was that of a family Christmas. Laughing people gathered around a table near a Christmas tree. In the centre of the group of people, a young girl dressed in all black smiled, as if she hadn't smiled in a long time. Oh, it's a bit like Inside Out. You know, Inside Out with the, um, the orbs. They're like memory orbs. Around this bright, clear ball and its inviting scene, other balls in the ball pit began morphing from filthy plastic to brilliant, transparent glass. Every glass ball lit up with its own little happy scene. Soon, all the plastic balls were shimmering. They all twinkled like dazzling stars in a clear night sky. So that means... There were a lot of happy endings? I, I don't know, I don't know what that means. That's very... I hope we get more explanation as to what that means. Oh no, it's, it's not gonna happen. Larson sat in Dr. Talbert's living room. It seemed strange to be sitting on the sofa in the very room where he had, had lain on the floor as the stitch race finally put an end to Eleanor. At that time, he would have said he would never return to this house. But he had to, he was a detective and he still had questions. Dr. Talbert sat in the armchair across from him. How can I help you, detective? There's just one more thing I wanted to clear up, Larson said. It's out of my own personal curiosity, really. Remnant. What is it? Is it some sort of magic? Yes, Larson! Yes! Thank you for asking this. Now we all know too. Oh my god, I'm so happy I'm gonna cry. As a younger man, Larson would never have thought magic was even a vague possibility, but he had seen lots of strange things since then. Talbot sighed. Remnant is... he paused. In non-scientific terms, it's like the metal is haunted. It's more complicated than that, of course, but it's similar to the way that water conducts electricity. Remnant is the mixing of the tangible with the intangible, of memory with the present. The people and things that are lost, it makes them almost real again. Talbot had a sad, faraway look in his eyes. You know, when Renelle was a little girl, she was sick. She was in and out of hospital on an almost constant basis. I was scared, terrified really, that, that she would die. I stayed up nights trying to think of ways to protect her. I made this little pendant for her out of remnant. That way, I figured I could never lose her entirely. Okay, so the heart-shaped pendant is made of remnant. That's good to know. Do you still have the pendant? Larson asked. Yes. Would you like to see it? Larson nodded. Talbot left the room and came back holding a chain from which a heart-shaped pendant dangled. He held it at a distance from his body, between his th finger and a thumb. At the same way, one might hold a dead mouse by the tail. Still... The necklace looked like an ordinary piece of jewellery any young girl might wear. Larson was sure no one ever gave it a second glance. It was a terrible mistake to create this, Talbot said, looking down at the necklace. It was my obsession in creating this that caused me to lose Renelle in the first place. I'm afraid I still don't understand, Larson said. If it's haunted, then haunted by what? Talbot didn't meet Larson's eyes. He held out the pendant. Here, why don't you take it? Larson was confused. Me? Yes, Talbot said. Take it, do what you want with it. I honestly can't even bear to look at it anymore. Talbot dropped the pendant into Larson's palm. It felt so small, so insignificant. Talbot walked Larson to the door. Thank you for stopping by, detective. And thank you for taking the pendant off my hands. Maybe now I can turn the page and start a new chapter in my life with my real daughter. Once Larson was on the sidewalk, he heard a soft, high-pitched sound. He looked around for the source of the noise and discovered it was coming from the pendant in his palm. It was like it was singing a song, but too softly for Larson to make out the words. He held up the pendant to inspect it, and the sun shone through it. It was dazzling. No! <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I don't want that to be it, I don't want that to be it, are you kidding me, <sighs> I'm unsatisfied, I mean, actually, 
Okay, I'm going to be real here. I'm going to be real. It's a really good ending. It's a great ending to the stage phase. I'm, I'm assuming this is the ending. This has to be the ending, right? There's nothing, there's nothing else left to conclude, really, apart from what the hell happened in the past 11 Fazbear Frights books. <laughs> but, um... Huh. Huh. Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that ending means. Both from, um... Both from... Uh, Larson's ending, um, and from Jake's, and uh, from Jake's perspective, but, uh, it's great that we've got Count the Ways in, in the bunch now, um, and, and I really like how they did that, actually, because now we know, um, what happened to Millie, and we also know how a lot of the stories could potentially be connected now, Right? Possibly. But the thing is, and here's the big things that I, I, I just quickly want to say. I, I'll probably make a few videos on this in the future. But I don't see what the connection is between a lot of these stories and the heart-shaped pendant, of course. I, obviously, the heart-shaped pendant is what Eleanor used to... to um, you know, to to make a lot of these stories happen. But I don't see how we can kind of prove that for each story. It would be really cool if at the end it was something like, oh yeah, and there was, there was something in every story that you missed. So go back and read all the stories and then you'll understand all of them. I really wish it was something like that, but it kind of isn't. Um, I really like the ball pit, but... I don't understand it. I still don't understand it. Um, the main questions I have are, yeah, sure, the, all of the individual plastic balls in this ball pit have, like, all these little memories kind of trapped inside. But why do they have the memories? Is it because they have Remnant in them? Because Remnant is, is now kind of confirmed to be, like, the memories of, of things. It's really difficult to... um to place because the way remnant was described also is kind of like the description of agony to me but they're not the same they can't be the same anyway i don't know i am gonna have to think about this for a long time um so yeah thank you guys so so much for watching and i will see you i guess in some theory videos uh, but other than that, I'll see you in January for Felix the Shark. <laughs> see ya. I'll see you then. Goodbye.